Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what, if Naruto has Sharingan and Bloodline. Before I start, please support for more amazing content, and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Sinisteruto and link in description and support writer. Let's start the video. Chapter 1 Disclaimer I do not own Naruto or any other series I might use for inspiration. The Meeting Hello Naruto-kun, I see you have finally woken up. My name is Yukushi Kabuto, despite how young I may look, I am a nurse employed here at the hospital. The white-haired twelve-year-old greeted with a kind smile. He was wearing a two-piece purple outfit with a sash around the waist along with blue shinobi sandals and a brown weapons pouch on his left side. His hair was tied in a ponytail, and his eyes appeared to be dark in color. I know. I've seen you around before, Naruto said with a hoarse voice, the seven-year-old Uzumaki having already established that he was at the hospital, yet again and that his near-fatal injuries had already healed thanks to his fast regeneration. Things were however different this time around, which is why there was heavy military guard around his room this time around. After all, for the first time since he was born, Naruto had not only killed someone today, but had killed a whooping twelve members of the civilian populace. Eight of them were not direct kills however as they were killed by the traps that the blonde Uzumaki had set up around his apartment in anticipation of his birthday, which just so happened to also be the anniversary of the QB attack. Four of the kills were however direct kills as Naruto had been forced to defend himself while attempting to flee from his pursuers, and Naruto had slit their throats with his kunai before he was hit by crossbow shots he hadn't seen coming, some of the civilians turning out to be skilled hunters so it would seem. Following that ordeal he had went on to receive the biggest beating he had yet to receive. To make matters worse he had killed a number of them, so the civilians were never going to be content with just a beating this time around, they were going to kill him and to hell with the Hokage and his decree. As far as they were concerned, Naruto had just proven what they already knew all along, that this kid was evil incarnate. Eventually, the ANBU had found it prudent to intercede before the boy died, because even the QB brat could not survive any more of those spear and knife stabs, not to mention getting stoned to death, as well. The Hokage had been called to the scene, but by then the civilian populace had already scattered and gone back to their homes, at least, that was the story that was being prepared for Naruto. Oh well that's good, and please don't worry. I know how the other nurses treat you, but I'm not like the others. I don't think you're a demon, and as far as you killing some of the civilians, I'm sure you already know, but according to Kanoha law, killing in self-defense is not a crime, Kabuto said with a kind smile and an even bigger mental smirk. The cogs in his brain working on overdrive as he tried to gauge the response of the young Uzumaki. Of course, he had no intention of recruiting the young Uzumaki, as far as he was aware the kid wasn't very talented, and on top of that recruiting a Jinchuriki would just bring the wrath of Kanoha upon himself, Odogekyur, and his master, and they, as much as he hated to admit it, were still far from ready to take on the might of Kanoha. However, he figured it wouldn't hurt to gauge the mettle of the young Jinchuriki and even if he couldn't recruit him officially, there was no harm getting him to resent Kanoha, perhaps the young Jinchuriki would destroy Kanoha for them. Or weaken it significantly enough for them to swoop in and deliver the killing blow when the time came that Odo was big enough and powerful enough to take on another hidden village. Nevertheless, Kabuto knew that the blonde Jinchuriki right now was completely under the Sandame's thumb. At least that was the case up until now. Right now that was a very debatable theory. After all, Naruto had just massacred some of the civilian populace, and Kabuto knew that he had to strike now before the Sandame Hokage could get to the young Uzumaki and start mending the fractured bridge. It's not, Naruto's eyes widened in surprise, an almost relieved facial expression appearing on his facial features. Of course not, it is your constitutional right enacted by Shodame sama himself. You know, you should take time to visit the civilian library Naruto-kun. Ninjutsu is all well and good, but not all battles are fought on the battlefield. Some battles are fought in the court of law or sometimes in the council room. People will exploit and manipulate you easily when you lack knowledge. Ignorance is the biggest weakness a person can have, a special one who not only aspires to become a shinobi, but to become the Hokage. Consider this experience to be a very important lesson Naruto Kun Kabuto said with a nice smile. Why you know about my dream? Naruto asked with wide eyes. Everybody knows Naruto Kun. You've shouted it out loud on the streets so many times I doubt there is a single soul in Kanoha who doesn't know, Kabuto said with a small chuckle. Hehehehe. I guess I can't say anything when you put it like that, Naruto replied, the blonde Uzumaki rubbing the back of his neck sheepishly. Yes you can't. In future however I wouldn't recommend it, Kabuto said with a grave undertone. What do you mean? Naruto asked with a confused expression, unable to comprehend why Kabuto was making such a big deal out of something that was so insignificant. I think you should know by now, it's not only the civilians who hate you, but also most of the shinobi populace. Imagine if one of your teachers at the academy is one of the shinobi who despise you. 
Don't you think they would possibly attempt to sabotage your development at the academy, especially if they thought that you were trying to attain a position that would make you their boss one day? Have you ever thought that maybe it isn't your fault that you are the dead last at the academy? I mean, think even bigger than that. What if some of the civilians are paying academy instructors to sabotage you? I mean, if they hate you enough to try to kill you, what else are they capable of doing in their vendetta against you? Kabuto said with a horrified and yet thoughtful expression, Naruto's own expression matching Kabuto's right at the moment, memories and flashbacks smacking into him all of a sudden. All the times he noticed that his script was different from the person sitting next to him, and all the times he'd realized that his taijutsu stance and katas didn't seem to match the rest of the class. The instructors had said it was because he was special that they had taught him the supposedly advanced katas and had told him that everyone's tests were different. Were they really sabotaging him? Were the civilians really paying them to do it? Would they go that yes, they definitely would go that far. Kabuto was right. If they could try to kill him, then there was nothing they wouldn't do to put him down. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to graduate if I'm not being taught the proper way to do things? Naruto asked desperately. Well, Kabuto trailed off with a sinister smirk as he needlessly fixed his glasses. What? What is it, Kabuto-san? Naruto asked anxiously, his innocent blue eyes widening as childlike curiosity and impatience took over the blonde's mind. I would offer to teach you but I'm nothing but a genin and I don't think someone like you would be interested in medical ninjutsu anyway. Besides, it would be illegal for me to teach you without the Hokage's consent as you are still a civilian and you and I are not clan members. The only way I could help you would be if we kept it a secret, but then again, I'm not sure how good you are at keeping secrets and I don't know if you would want to keep secrets from your Gigi. I'll do it. I promise Kabuto-san. I won't tell anyone. The blonde Uzumaki pleaded. Hmm, I don't know naruto Kun. I mean, you do know that we'll both be in trouble if anyone were to find out, right? And that's not all. I'll be in even more trouble than you not only because I don't have a close relationship with the Hokage like you do, but also because there is a higher burden of responsibility on me as I am a shinobi and you are. Right now, just an academy student. Kabuto said in a way that made it seem as if he was unsure about what to do. Oh, I guess you really can help me then. It's okay though, you've already helped me a lot already, and I don't want you to be in trouble because of me Naruto trailed off with a sad expression the blonde Uzumaki squeezing tightly on his sheets as tears began to sting his eyes, though doing well to stop them from falling out. No actually, I may have a plan that will almost guarantee that we don't get caught Kabuto trailed off with a sinister smirk, unable to believe how simple and yet so ingenious a plan he had come up with. He'd discovered just how much chakra the boy had when he was performing a diagnostic jutsu on him earlier, and needless to say, the discovery had blown his mind away. That was why he knew that his plan would work perfectly. All he had to do was to teach the kid the Kage Bunshin technique, and with his chakra reserves, the jutsu would not take too long to master. This way, he would have the kid's shadow clone attend classes in his steed while he had the kid all to himself for the majority of the day. If he was busy on that particular day then he would send his own shadow clone to meet up with the kid. What is it Kabuto-san? Tell me. Naruto almost yelled excitedly, which he would have done had he not promised Kabuto that he would hush things up about their prospective student-teacher relationship. Tell me naruto -kun. How would you like it if I taught you a new jutsu? Five years later. It's not like you to pay me an unexpected visit Naruto-kun. Were you perhaps hoping to catch me in the middle of concocting a sinister plot against you? Kabuto taunted with a trademark smirk and the habitual two-finger push of his glasses, the medical ninja prodigy not bothering to turn around and face the blonde Uzumaki as he simply continued to do whatever he was doing to the corpse in front of him, probably conducting one of his corpse-slash-DNA experiments which was Kabuto's specialty and favorite part of research, something that he had admittedly passed on to Naruto himself, as he seemed to like playing with corpses almost just as much as Kabuto did. You know you're incredibly hard to sneak up on for someone that isn't even a sensor type. Nevertheless, it is your master whom I do not trust, not you, and no, I wasn't hoping to catch you doing anything I wouldn't already expect you to be doing, I just came here to get some information about my new Jonin sensei, Hataki Kakashi. I was hoping you could let me take a look at what you have on your info cards about him. Naruto said as he walked right up to his sensei, standing right next to him as he curiously looked over at what Kabuto was doing to the corpse. He was no longer wearing his orange jumpsuit, a change he had made only when he woke up this morning in order to attend the Genin inauguration ceremony. He was now wearing black ninja pants with white bandages around the ankles and equally black ninja sandals along with a brown weapons pouch on his left thigh. Upstairs he was wearing a forehead protector around his head with a black cloth to wrap it around and a dark orange sweater with black stripes and an Uzumaki swirl at the back. Hokage Naruto outfit without the Hokage cloak. On his back he was carrying the Fujin no Ken, which was actually a gun by that he used as his primary weapon. Every new graduate, along with the teachers and the Hokage himself had been shocked when they saw Naruto's new appearance, 
but even more shocking, for those who noticed, was the fact that he looked taller than he'd been the previous day and that there seemed to be a significantly less amount of baby fat on his facial features as was there the previous day. The first instinct for, well, everyone, was to put their hands in a ram hand seal and exclaim the word Kai as their chakra surged in an attempt to dispel the illusion, however when nothing happened, everyone was left completely stupefied. Naruto for his part did well to pretend that he didn't notice everyone acting weirded out in front of him, the blonde Uzumaki content to just sit on his own and wait silently for the teams to be announced, and their sensei to take them away. Even he however had not expected to spend four hours waiting for his sensei to arrive, not to mention having to spend so much time in the same room as Sasuke and Sakura, though it wasn't half as annoying as he expected it to be. Sasuke for the most part, apart from the few curious and suspicious gazes that were directed his way, kept to himself and refused to engage in any sort of conversation, not that Naruto attempted mind you. Sakura seemed to be split between staring dreamily at Sasuke and casting murderous glares at Naruto, though the blonde Uzumaki remained unfazed by such behavior. Eventually she had cracked and yelled at him to stop trying to act like Sasuke, but Naruto had replied with a simple okay and carried on minding his own business, a reaction that had stunned her enough to keep her quiet for the rest of the time they spent there. In any case, they were supposed to have some kind of test tomorrow morning and Naruto was keen to pass the test so that he can become a shinobi, not because he wanted to serve Konoha or wanted to become Hokage mind you, but because he wanted to travel the world and see places. Which he'd already been doing but under disguise and while having to not only leave a clone behind but also having to use the ANBU code to the security barrier that Kabuto had given to him so that he wouldn't alert the barrier squad of his departure. Now however he could go on missions and interact with the rest of the world freely, relatively speaking of course. So your Jonin sensei is Hataki Kakashi huh, just as you predicted. Kabuto said as he stopped what he was doing, directing an inquisitive stare at the blonde Uzumaki. It was very easy to predict in all honesty. He was my father's student and he had an Uchiha teammate and friend, not to mention that Sasuke is the last Uchiha, thereby in need of a Sharingan wielder to show him the ropes. We were always going to be in the same team whether I finished dead last or not. Naruto retorted. Kabuto was of course the reason that Naruto knew about his parents. The medical ninja had noticed some discrepancies in the story that the third had told Naruto about his past, some very glaring ones too, and the more he thought about it the more he realized that there had to be more to Naruto's background than meets the eye. That's when he had decided to break into the sealed records section of the hospital, and do some thorough research. He'd found out through his research that Naruto's mother was Uzumaki Kushina, who ironically enough, had also been a Kyuubi Jinchuriki, and then he'd found out that she was not only secretly married to the Yandame, but that she'd also had an aunt who lived in the village and who had, once again ironically enough, been a Kyuubi Jinchuriki too and had been married to the Shodame Hokage. Kabuto had struggled for days to come to terms with what he had learned, so much so that he had decided to do background research about the Uzumaki family, only to find out that not only were they a prestigious clan rivaling the Uchiha and the Senju, but that they had actually had their own ninja village and were masters of seals and barriers. It became clear from that moment, as far as Kabuto was concerned that Naruto would become a lot more than a distraction and side project that he was working, oh no no no, he was going to be a lot more than that. Naruto would be the key to mastering both the Edo Tensei technique and completing and perfecting the curse seal that he and Orochimaru-sama were working on, though Kabuto was still getting around to asking the blonde Uzumaki for his help regarding that. In any case, Kabuto had revealed the information to the blonde Uzumaki, but had made sure he revealed it in a way that would not endear the young Uzumaki to either the people of Konoha or his precious Gigi. It had worked perfectly of course, as Naruto neither trusted nor even liked the Sandame Hokage anymore, and he didn't seem to harbor any love for the people of Konoha at all, well, apart from the Ikarakus. Speaking of which, Kabuto had thought deeply about brutally severing that tie, perhaps to stage a situation where the villagers would end up killing the Ikarakus in order to hurt the blonde Uzumaki. However, Naruto's affinity for corpses and his growth in personality, growth meaning his likeliness to Kabuto over the time that he had mentored the blonde had made him abandon that plan, turned out it wouldn't be necessary after all. Nevertheless, Kabuto had found out that the abode that Uzumaki Kushina and the Yandame shared together was still intact and actually had a barrier warding it against trespassers. That's when Kabuto had convinced Naruto that he was the only one that could go in and that he should as he would learn more of the truth about his parents, and maybe even inherit Jutsu scrolls left behind by his parents, which is indeed what had been waiting for the blonde Uzumaki. Kabuto had of course taught Naruto the shadow clone on the day they met at the hospital so that Naruto could send his clone to school and then spend the rest of the day learning from Kabuto. However, they had discovered that Naruto was able to retain all the knowledge that his clone collected in class, and that's when Kabuto had decided to literally switch things up. Instead of sending his clone to school, they would send the real Naruto to school, and one clone would go to the Uzumaki family home and learn the Fuinjutsu, Barrier, and Kenjutsu knowledge of the Uzumaki clan. 
However, Naruto had rejected the idea, saying that he, the original, would spend his days doing the strength and endurance training of the Uzumaki clan and the speed, reflex, agility, and reaction time training program that his father had developed for close-range fighting. He also said that he would separate his clones between sealing jutsu, barrier jutsu, kenjutsu and taijutsu kata, medical ninjutsu, and elemental ninjutsu, that he also needed to assign one for each task when he could make so many. A single reinforced clone would go to school every day for the rest of his academy years, and Naruto had grown by leaps and bounds in that time, mentally, physically, and ninjutsu-wise. It seems like you already know a lot about Hataki Kakashi Naruto-kun, I'm not really sure what you need me for, Kabuto retorted. Just give me the damn info card, sensei, Naruto said with a sigh of exasperation. HN, I guess patience will never be your strongest suit, Kabuto retorted as he pulled out the info card, or rather, cards. Four cards just for one guy, seems like you've done a thorough job on this guy, as expected of you, Kabuto-sensei, Naruto said as he studied the information on his new sensei. Of course I did, information is practically useless if it is not collected in its entirety, Kabuto snorted arrogantly. Speaking of which, there is something of grave importance that I wish to bring to your attention when you're done, Kabuto said with a grave undertone. He already figured out on his own that I work for Orochimaru-sama anyway, and he still hasn't gone anywhere. Maybe he won't mind helping out here and there with some of our projects. Kabuto thought anxiously. The following day. Mwa! Naruto no Baka! Where the hell have you been? We've been waiting here for three hours already! Sakura exclaimed furiously, wanting nothing more than to smack the living daylights out of the blonde Uzumaki but unfortunately not having the energy or the enthusiasm for it given how drowsy and hungry she was right now. Yeah I didn't see any reason to arrive early given how late our sensei was yesterday. I did a bit of an investigation yesterday and found out that the guy is always late, not sometimes, not most of the time, but always. Naruto emphasized the point, the blonde Uzumaki standing over his two worn-out looking teammates as they sat against the tree in the cover of shade. T that can't possibly be true. He's a jonin, how can someone so unprofessional have retained his position, much less get promoted in the first place? Sakura asked with an affronted facial expression, Sasuke himself also looking at the blonde incredulously though choosing not to voice his thoughts on the matter out loud. Well, it can only mean one thing Naruto trailed off with a grave undertone. What? Sakura asked anxiously. He was must be so skilled, so strong, and or so important that the Hokage is willing to overlook his deficiencies entirely in order to continue to enjoy his services to the village. Naruto said as if it was the most obvious thing in the world, both Sakura and Sasuke's eyes widening in surprise as Naruto's words sank in. In any case, I figured you guys would be starving by now so I brought you some food, Naruto said as he tossed two scrolls at the duo, one for each one of them. Naruto, weren't you listening when Kakashi-sensei ordered us not to eat anything today? Sakura exclaimed indignantly, though the effect completely nullified by the howls of her empty stomach. He never ordered that we shouldn't eat, he only recommended it. Besides, if you're going to be doing any extreme or strenuous activity, then all the more reason to eat a balanced meal before activity. Kakashi-sensei was obviously playing a trick on us for suggesting that we shouldn't eat, especially considering how late he is. Naruto said matter-of-factly, both Sakura's and Naruto's eyes widening once again in surprise, not only at the realization of the truth in Naruto's words but also at how smart Naruto was turning out to be. When did you learn to use your brain, Do? Sasuke said as he unsealed the avocado, cheese, and tomato sandwiches from the scroll, Sakura following in her crush's lead, albeit hesitantly, convincing herself that it had to be the right move if Sasuke was doing it. Not long ago, Naruto replied honestly, the jaws of his teammates smacking the ground as they stared disbelievingly at the blonde Jinchuriki, either of them able to believe that Naruto not only didn't retaliate viciously at the object of his one-sided rivalry, but that he didn't even seem to take offense at all. Almost as if admitting that he had previously been incapable of using his brain. I'd suggest you eat up before our sensei decides to make his presence known. Naruto warned, Sasuke quickly grabbing a sandwich and stuffing it inside his mouth, or at least would have had Kakashi not decided to make his presence known just as Naruto had warned, the copy mean poofing into existence right between the Genin trio. Sasuke, I thought I warned you about what would happen if you ate today, Kakashi said with a relatively heavy dose of killing intent directed at the last Uchiha. I don't care. I've decided that your advice is garbage. Besides, you also said to arrive at 5am and look what time you arrived, Sasuke retorted. Hmm, as I recall, I never said that I would arrive at the same time as you did, therefore, Naruto, you automatically failed the exam for failing to follow your commander's orders. Kakashi said as he turned and faced the blonde with even more killing intent directed at the young Jinchuriki. Negative. I've been here the whole time. Just because you didn't know I was here doesn't mean that I wasn't. 
On the contrary, you fail as a commander for failing to notice such an important detail. Naruto countered swiftly, causing Kakashi's lone visible eye to widen in surprise, Sasuke and Sakura also spotting pop-eyed expressions. Do you have proof that you were here? Kakashi countered. Do you have proof that I wasn't? Naruto countered in return, causing Kakashi's lone visible eye to narrow dangerously at the blonde Uzumaki. Sakura, did you see or sense Naruto's presence before he appeared before you? Kakashi asked authoritatively. And no sensei. Sakura replied nervously. Sasuke, did you see Naruto or sense his presence in any other way before he revealed himself to you? Kakashi asked authoritatively. No. Sasuke ground out irritably, the rookie of the year wondering if Naruto really was here the whole time or if he was just playing the Cyclops in order not to get disqualified. And also wondering what that meant about not only Naruto's skills but also his own lack of them if Naruto really was there the whole time and he had just not been able to detect his presence. So either Sasuke, Sakura, or I were able to detect any signs of your presence, that's more than enough reason to believe that you were in fact not here. Kakashi argued. Sasuke, Sakura, were any of you able to detect Kakashi Sensei's presence before he revealed himself? Naruto asked with a serious tone, totally catching the copy Nin and his teammates off guard, none of them having expected that line of questioning. Answer the question. Naruto ordered with a harsh tone, snapping the duo from their stupor. No slash and no. The duo replied simultaneously. Sasuke spotting a confused frown as he wondered what the hell the dobe was up to. Nor did I. Naruto lied through his teeth. After all, he was a very accomplished sensor type shinobi. There was no way he hadn't detected the copy nin's presence. However, they didn't know that now, did they? What's your point? Kakashi countered. My point is it is that it is irrelevant whether you were able to detect my presence, or not because going by your logic, you were not here to begin with if all three of us were not aware of your presence. And if you continue to insist that you were here despite the three of us not detecting your presence, then I will also insist that I was here despite the three of you failing to detect my presence. Naruto argued intelligently, once again surprising everyone with his logic. Then I will prove that I was here by reciting everything that Sakura did since she arrived. Kakashi countered. What will you do now, Naruto? Kakashi pondered. And I will prove I was here by reciting everything that Sasuke did since he arrived. Naruto retorted with a triumphant smirk. Kakashi's lone eye narrowing again at the implications of what Naruto was saying, because if he really was here the whole time and Kakashi failed to detect him, then that would mean that either he had slipped badly in these times of peace, or there was a lot more to the his sensei's son than meets the eye. It took fifteen minutes for Kakashi to recite enough of Sakura's activities since she arrived to convince everyone that he was indeed present the whole time, and it took around about the same time for Naruto to do the same for Sasuke, proving that he was in fact there the whole time, and of course, Neither he nor Kakashi would admit that it was only a shadow clone of theirs that had been there whereas they, the originals, had been busy with their own thing. And there you have it. See, I was here the whole time, Naruto said with a triumphant smirk, acutely aware that this revelation would raise suspicion regarding his true skill level, but willing to take any hit to his cover for the sake of graduating, as he was fed up of being cooped up in the village. To say Sakura and Sasuke were livid would amount to a massive understatement, both the two top students in the graduation class equally disturbed and angered by recent revelations though for completely different reasons. Sakura was pissed off because in her mind, Naruto was nothing but a perverted stalker who had spent hours spying on her quality time with her beloved Sasuke-kun. Sasuke was angered mostly at himself for not only his ignorance and naivety that had led him to being tricked by Kakashi and outdone by Naruto, who had seen through Kakashi's ruse, but also because of the fact that it seemed like both Kakashi and Naruto could have killed him if they wanted to without him even knowing he was dead until he met his family in the afterlife. If the two of them, especially Naruto was capable of something like that, then just how far away was he from Itachi's level? Would he ever even reach that level? Ten minutes later. Both of your comrades have done the smart thing and taken cover, not only to buy time to come up with a strategy to take me down, but also so that they can catch me by surprise by surprise attacking me. That is not only the smart thing to do, but it is also the shinobi thing to do. What you are doing however Kakashi trailed off, leaving Naruto and his two teammates, who were no doubt listening from their hiding spots to put together the rest of the sentence. I wonder if reading a pornographic novel as you are about to be attacked with the intention to kill is also the shinobi thing to do, Naruto countered. Ma ma don't worry about me, I'll be fine, Kakashi said with a nice smile, scratching the back of his head sheepishly, that is, before his voice and expression all of a sudden turned cold and serious. Besides, a true shinobi should not be concerned with the well-being of his enemies, but only with the completion of his mission. He he he. You will rue those words very soon. Kakashi Sensei Naruto trailed off as he adopted a one-handed ram hand seal. Sexy no jutsu, no era rin. 
Naruto said as he transformed into an adult version of Kakashi's deceased teammate. Adult not only in age and size but also in terms of rating, as she was wearing only a blue g-string and a matching bra. She also had far more enticing curves than Kakashi remembered and quite an incredible bust too. Her hair was longer too, reaching all the way to just below her buttocks, but she still had those brown expressive eyes and the tattoos on each of her cheeks. To complete the jutsu, Naruto would have had to say some provocative and seductive things while posing and twisting in an equally seductive manner. However, he had no idea what Rin's voice sounded like when she was alive and therefore had no idea what it would sound like as an adult. As a result, the jutsu couldn't be completed and Naruto therefore had to settle for a provocative pose, blowing a kiss at the copy nin, and using a come here motion with his right index finger. Sakura and Sasuke were not only shocked but also confused and dumbfounded by what the blonde Uzumaki was doing, so much so that Sakura was convinced that Naruto didn't belong anywhere besides a mental institution or a prison cell for the notoriously delinquent behavior he has exhibited throughout his academy years and until now. Sasuke on the other hand was convinced that Naruto's earlier feats were just a fluke because there was no way someone could be so dumb and smart at the same time. As for Kakashi, well that was another story altogether. He was of course initially caught off guard by the blonde Uzumaki strategy, if one could call it that. However, thoughts of confusion had crossed his mind, such as how Naruto even knew about Rin in the first place. And then finally rage. Uncontrollable rage welled up in the copy Nin's heart of hearts. Because this his atrocity in front of him was an insult of the highest order to him. Naruto might as well have crushed his balls and used them to make an omelette. No one was going to get away with taking a dump on her memory, of all the people, her. Naruto Kakashi trailed off dangerously, shadows hovering around his lone visible eye as the snapping sound of the copy meme closing his favorite pornographic novel reverberated around the clearing, a terrible killing intent washing over the whole forest, enough to completely freeze Sasuke and Sakura. Thoughts of suicide crossing the mind of one Uchiha Sasuke, Perhaps an actual attempt might have even materialized had the killing intent been directed at him. Hey, I told you you would regret your words shortly Kakashi-kun, Naruto said with a tone of voice that he imagined would belong to a girl like Rin based on the information Kabuto had gathered, though of course unable to resist the addition of a seductive purr to the voice. You have crossed the line, and I'm afraid you are too far gone for a light punishment. Allow me to teach you a little about respect for the deceased heroes of Konoha, and to teach you about the true meaning of Pai, Kakashi trailed off two hands popped out from under the ground each grabbing hold of one of his ankles. Earth release, double suicide decapitation technique. Naruto's real voice sounded as Kakashi was pulled under the ground, the copy Nin too surprised and too unsuspecting to mount any form of resistance, or maneuver to either stop himself from getting pulled under or substitute himself with something else to escape the trap. It would have been bad if that was all that happened, however, that was the least of it as Rin summoned a kunai and threw it with incredible power and speed towards the copy Nin's head. Earth style, earth eruption technique. Kakashi exclaimed quickly as the earth beneath him shifted and rose up from under the ground, the copy ninja pulling out his own kunai and preparing to deflect the oncoming kunai, everything happening at unreadable speeds, at least, as far as Sakura and Sasuke were concerned. Ninja art, shadow clone kunai technique. Rin muttered with a cross hand sign as the lone kunai turned into hundreds of kunai flying at the copy ninja. As if that wasn't bad enough, Rin had hidden another kunai in the shadow of the one she threw which meant that every kunai that appeared when she used the shadow clone kunai technique also had another kunai hiding in its shadow. This made things extremely difficult for the copy ninja as he tried to dodge and parry all the kunai that came his way, getting scratches and nicks here and there and even having some kunai land flush on his forearms and legs, doing everything possible to protect his torso and head to avoid damage to his vital organs. Kyuso. I didn't even get a chance to use the Sharingan or perform the hand seals for an earth wall. This kid is at another level altogether. Clearly the academy records were fabricated, the only question is, is Sandame sama responsible for this or did he simply hide his skill from everyone on his own accord? Kakashi pondered wearily. Impressive Kakashi-kun, you really have grown over the years since we last met. I don't think you would have Rin trailed off as the sound of an extremely loud and potent explosion snuffed out her voice, the explosion, surprisingly enough, coming from Kakashi himself as it appeared as though either he suicide bombed himself, or had an explosive placed on him without his knowledge the latter being true off course. Once again, to say Sasuke and Sakura were shocked would amount to a massive understatement, but this time, even more surprised, and in terrible pain, was their new sensei Hataki Kakashi, who was now lying face down in a crater that had formed when his body exploded, having no clue as to how or when an explosive was placed on him. Or even what kind of explosive it was. The only thing that he knew was that he was lucky to be alive, albeit, unable to move any of his limbs as he lay there on the ground, not liking at all the feeling of total helplessness and vulnerability that he was exposed to right now. Abito-kun. 
Couldn't you at least have waited for me to finish talking before you blew our sensei up? Rin exclaimed as she directed her gaze to the ground next to her. A twelve-year-old dressed in a blue outfit with goggles on his head popping out from under the ground soon after Rin finished speaking. Hehehehe. <laughs> I'm sorry Rinchan, but I didn't want to give him time to discover that I switched the bells with transformed exploding shadow clones when I dragged him underground. Abito said sheepishly, Kakashi, Sasuke, and Sakura just now noticing that the twelve-year-old boy had two bells hanging around his own waist. HNMPH. I guess you do kind of have a point. Rin replied with a cute pout. Kakashi glaring murderously at the disgusting and underhanded tactics that the blonde Uzumaki was using, wanting nothing more than anything in the world right now than to torture and eliminate the abominations of his teammates that Naruto was parading in front of him. He, Yeah. Still, can't believe Kakashi was stupid enough not to use the Sharingan he stole from me all those years ago. If he had, he might have seen the chakra in the bells and realized that they weren't the bells that he placed on his waist. Abito said mockingly, Kakashi's lone visible eye narrowing murderously at the blonde user, black-haired Uchiha standing a few meters away from him. What do you take me for a Bidokuin, an amateur? I'm the one who made sure Kakashi's hands were too occupied for him to remove his forehead protector from his eyes, and even if he managed it, I made sure he was too occupied to get a chance to look down at his belt line during the battle. Me, you always try to take credit for everything. Dobe. Give me one of the bells, Sasuke demanded as he walked out from his hiding position, having confirmed that Kakashi was no longer a threat anymore. He would later interrogate the Dobe. Maybe even Kakashi himself now that the Dobe had incapacitated him about the Sharingan that Kakashi supposedly stole, maybe even forcefully take it back. But for now, he needed to pass the damn test, and for that, he needed to get the stupid bell from the stew actually deceptively smart Dobe. Sure, Abito said as he tossed one of the bells to the last Uchiha, Sasuke jumping far away from the bell as if it was poison or something, staring murderously at the blonde Uzumaki, Naruto having cancelled the Rin transformation, taken the second bell from Abito, and then dispelled Abito in that time frame. What's wrong? I thought you wanted one of the bells, Naruto asked innocently. What the hell do you take me for? A dobe? How do I know that isn't one of your exploding shadow clones transformed? Sasuke asked irritably, now starting to truly comprehend how dangerous Naruto actually was, and also starting to wonder where the hell the dobe had actually learned such a powerful and dangerous technique. Not only able to manifest real clones of himself, and even his weapons, but also able to make them explode even. Kyuso. If I had awakened my Sharingan this wouldn't be an issue. Not only would I be able to copy his jutsu, but I would also be able to see through his stupid clone transformations. Sasuke thought irritably. Why would I try to blow you up? The mission was to get one of the bells from Kakashi-sensei, and to attack him with the intent to kill. Nothing was said about attacking you or Sakura. Besides, if I was a murderous psychopath then Kakashi-sensei wouldn't be alive right now. I would have put more chakra in the clones and made an explosion strong enough to wipe him out of existence. Naruto said as if merely talking about the weather forecast, as if defeating and eliminating an elite jonin was something any ordinary genin should have been capable of. His attempt to pacify the last Uchiha only serving to aggravate him even more than he was currently, Sasuke clenching his fists in anger and frustration, unable to understand how the dobe could possibly possess so much power and skill. Having worked tirelessly for years himself and being from the Uchiha clan, and yet not feeling confident that he would have defeated Kakashi so easily, if at all. If only two people can pass the exam. It makes sense that the dobe would give the other bell to me. Sakura is useless, and although the dobe has a ridiculous fanboy syndrome for her, even he knows that I am by far the better choice for a teammate than her. Maybe he isn't trying to trick me, maybe he is making the logical choice that will benefit him in the short and long run, Sasuke concluded, though still having doubts due to Naruto's notorious animosity and jealousy towards him at the academy and of course the notorious pranking exploits he was capable of. No. That dobe was obviously a cover identity. This is the real dobe. He's been hiding his true power and true self the whole time. Sasuke thought irritably, the seeds of hatred once again starting to fester in his heart as he realized what a fool the dobe had been making of him this whole time. This whole time that he had been under the false belief that the dobe was the fool and that he had been the one making even more of a fool of the dobe every time they clashed at the academy. You seem hesitant. Let me make it easy on you. Here, take this one as well. Give it to Sakura or do whatever it is that you want to do with it. I'm not interested in serving under a captain that would turn his own subordinates against each other for his own amusement, nor one that would discard one of them because they couldn't get a stupid bell. As far as I'm concerned, Kakashi can go eat it for all I care, Naruto said as he threw the bell at the last Tachiha and turned on his heel and walked away, Sasuke so shocked by not only Naruto's decision, but also by his reasons for making that decision. Though also filled with self-loathing for the feeling of admiration and inspiration that the dobe provoked from within him, though he was very quick and precise in ruthlessly snuffing out any positive feelings that might be directed towards the dobe. Wait dobe. 
Where the hell are you going? Sasuke asked. Well, not really asked. It was after all beneath him as an Uchiha to ask anything of anyone. Oh no, Uchiha don't ask for anything as far as he is concerned. They only make demands. Back to the academy. Maybe I'll be lucky enough to get a decent Jonin sensei next time around. Naruto said as he stopped momentarily to address his former fake rival, or once upon a time real rival, before carrying on with his journey back to that hellhole of a place. Which would be an even bigger hell as he would probably have to attend it himself now instead of sending a reinforced shadow clone like he'd done for the past five years. Sasuke was conflicted, and Sakura was furious at Naruto. She couldn't believe how cool Naruto was trying to act, and she couldn't forgive him for trying to outshine her precious Sasuke-kun. To her, Naruto should have just backed off and allowed Sasuke to take care of Kakashi-sensei, and he had no right to steal Sasuke's style and act so cool. Of course, in her fragile little mind, and partially in Sasuke's as well, they couldn't fathom a few simple facts. One was that Kakashi hadn't gone all out, after all, which self-respecting Jonin would go all out on a fresh out of the academy student. Two was that even if he had done all he could have, he would have still not been fighting at full strength if he wasn't using his Sharingan. 3 was that he was defeated because he was caught off guard by the blonde Uzumaki skill and intelligence, mainly because he had false intel regarding the blonde Uzumaki. Sasuke understood the second and third reasons, after all, he'd heard Naruto's Obito clone say that Kakashi was hiding a Sharingan behind the part of his forehead protector that was covering his left eye. And he himself had come to realize that any intel that he previously had on the blonde Uzumaki was either outdated or was never true to begin with. However, a combination of his Uchiha pride and the fact that he didn't believe Itachi would have lost to Naruto under the same circumstances, or any other circumstances for that matter, led him to the same conclusion anyway, that their Jonin sensei was weak and incompetent. It also didn't help Kakashi's case that he had shown an unreal level of laziness and tardiness since they met him. Sakura's psyche on the other hand was rather simple to analyze, she simply believed that if Naruto could defeat Kakashi, then not only was he weak, but that also meant that Sasuke would have defeated him in an even swifter and cooler fashion than Naruto did. Dobe, Sasuke exclaimed again. What now? Naruto asked in exasperation, turning around to look at the last Uchiha with a little irritation palpable in his facial features. Wait for me. Twenty minutes later. A lot had happened in the short time since Sasuke made the surprising decision to follow the blonde Uzumaki back to the village. Naruto could honestly say he had been surprised by the decision Sasuke made, after all, going back to the academy was going to stall his plans for revenge by a whole year, so for him to make that decision was surprising. Naruto of course had decided to accept Sasuke's offer to go back to the academy with him, and hadn't been surprised at all when Sakura came out of her hiding spot and followed them back, or rather, followed Sasuke back to the academy. Naruto wanted to laugh when he saw the expression on Sasuke's face, easily able to tell that Sasuke had been hoping Sakura wouldn't be bold enough to make such a rebellious decision given how much of a sucker for rules she was perhaps hoping that she would take the bells and become Kakashi's student, thereby ridding himself of a terrible burden. Team Seven's journey hadn't lasted very long however and they never made it to the academy, a cat-masked, blue-haired female ANBU intercepting them and delivering orders from the Hokage that Naruto report to the Hokage immediately and that Sakura and Sasuke not return to the academy and instead go back home and await further instruction. Sasuke of course had demanded to know why Naruto had to report to the Hokage but had been swiftly shut down and told to simply follow orders or face the consequences. Naruto had sensed two more presences arrive at the location where they all neglectfully left an incapacitated Kakashi, and then carry him away towards the Kanoha hospital. He'd had to wait for fifteen minutes for the Hokage to let him into his office, probably a stalling tactic designed to increase his anxiety levels he supposed, but anyway he was inside the office now, the Hokage taking his merry time to light up his pipe and smoke in front of the blonde Uzumaki, something he'd never done before. Naruto content to just sit there and watch the Hokage expressionlessly as if the Hokage was nothing of consequence to him, just another random villager. All the while Haruzen had been watching the blonde Uzumaki with a calculating eye. In fact, he'd been watching the blonde Uzumaki since he started battling Kakashi, and he had also watched the young Jinchuriki when he made him wait for fifteen minutes outside of his office. Haruzen had planned to make him wait much longer, however, seeing as he hadn't seemed phased at all by the wait, he'd realized that his stalling tactic was a waste of time and decided to let him in anyway, thinking that perhaps a face-to-face -face stalling tactic would work which it clearly wasn't, Haruzen, despite his vast experience and keen eye. Unable to read anything negative or positive from the blonde Uzumaki, though the fact he couldn't read anything was a negative reading on its own as far as he was concerned. So Naruto-kun, as you well know, I always watch over the village with the keen eye of my crystal ball, as is my duty as the Hokage. However, imagine my surprise when I happened upon a scene of you and your jonin sensei fighting Haruzen trailed off waiting patiently to see how the blonde Uzumaki would respond now that he had set the premise upon which the impromptu meeting was founded upon. 
a barely visible hint of frustration settling in when Hiruzen realized that the blonde Uzumaki was not going to dignify his not-so-subtle invitation to speak. Did you hear what I said, Naruto-kun? Hiruzen asked with his usual grandfatherly tone, though the intensity of his eyes and the atmosphere told Naruto exactly what he knew, that this man was the furthest thing from a grandfather to him, that this was a dangerous military dictator that is capable of anything, good or bad. I did, Hokage-sama. Naruto replied simply, Hiruzen's eyes narrowing slightly at the blonde Uzumaki, not only because of his brief and dismissive response, but also because the blonde Uzumaki had addressed him formally and respectfully instead of his usually affectionate manner in which Naruto usually addressed him. Is there something you want to say to me, Naruto-kun? You know you can tell me anything, right? Hiruzen asked, once again using a grandfatherly tone. Right, Naruto retorted simply, showing neither sarcasm nor seriousness, nor doubt or belief in that statement, simply stating it as it is, nothing more nothing less, causing Hiruzen to sigh in exasperation, showing a weary and vulnerable side of himself to the blonde Uzumaki. Why won't you talk to me, Naruto-kun? I thought that our bond was a lot stronger than this. I thought you knew that you could always come to me if you needed anything. Hiruzen said with a hurt expression, deciding that perhaps a different tactic was required to play on the blonde Uzumaki's emotions. I don't even know what you want me to talk about, and by the way you sound like a neglected housewife right now, unbecoming of a person in your position don't you think? Naruto asked rhetorically. Sarutobi's expression changing once again as he finally confirmed that this was the polar opposite of the Naruto that he knew. Clearly this person in front of him, whoever he was, was not the same Naruto that he knew, if the Naruto he knew ever existed to begin with. Naruto, I don't want to have to do this to you, but I will do what I have to protect the village Hiruzen trailed off with a threatening undertone. To protect the village? From who? Me? I wasn't aware that I was an enemy to the village, when did this happen, Hokage-sama? Naruto asked with a lot of spite in his tone, Sarutobi cursing under his breath when he realized the mistake he was making, or thought he was making. As it seemed like he was the one that was turning the blonde Uzumaki into an enemy by his words and actions today, which of course was not true, because he had done that a long time ago already, he just didn't know it yet. Naruto-kun, you graduated dead last at the academy, yet you managed to defeat not only an elite jonin with ease today, but someone who is considered to be a legendary figure in the shinobi world and rated amongst the best ANBU operatives the village has ever had. As if it wasn't shocking enough that you beat Kakashi in the first place, you also used jutsu that you have never shown before, jutsu that you couldn't possibly know, such as the shadow clone kunai and explosive shadow clone technique. And finally, there is the matter of fact that just yesterday you were the shortest graduate from your class, and now you are around the same height as one Uchiha Sasuke, possibly taller. Can you blame me for being concerned by these drastic changes Naruto-kun? Hiruzen asked innocently. Yes, Naruto replied matter-of-factly, once again completely catching Sarutobi Hiruzen off guard with his response. Excuse me? Hiruzen asked disbelievingly. You're not my father or grandfather for that matter, and you're not my clan head or anything of the sort. There is no reason why these developments should be of concern to you, or is there something you're not telling me? Naruto asked the question that Sarutobi dreaded, because he knew whether Naruto intended for it to be or not. That it was in fact a trick question because he knew that he couldn't justify what he was doing without admitting that he was singling Naruto out, and was doing so because Naruto is Konoha's military weapon. However, if he admitted that fact to Naruto, he had a feeling that there would be no going back, he will have lost control of the blonde Uzumaki completely. Losing control of Naruto was not only bad for Konoha, but it was also bad for him, and whether Naruto knew it or not, it would ultimately prove to be bad for the blonde Uzumaki too as Hiruzen would have to get Danzo involved and use his methods to control Naruto something he didn't want to do but would ultimately do it if he had to. There was of course another way he could go about it, but that would involve getting Jiraiya and maybe even Tsunade involved in the matter. Jiraiya would cooperate, but Tsunade was a wild card and could potentially cause more harm than good with her current anti kanoha slash anti-hidden village mentally. Are you still angry about what happened two nights ago? Hiruzen eventually asked after staring at the blonde-haired Uzumaki for what seemed like an eternity. Listen, I don't have time for this nonsense. So let me put it to you straight. Shadow clone technique is not the only jutsu I learned from the scroll, I don't even understand how that should not have been obvious. I learned the shadow clone variations as well. As for beating Kakashi, I also failed to see how it can be that surprising considering I defeated an experienced Chunin two nights ago with overwhelming ease when he was trying to kill me. It's not like I haven't shown the potential to do what I did today with careful planning. Speaking of careful planning, I'm the guy that stole the forbidden scroll in the first place and have outwitted and eluded your ANBU personnel on many occasions as a mere academy student. As for my sudden growth spurt, that should also be obvious, if you couldn't figure out by now that my sexy jutsu is actually a shape-shifting technique as opposed to the normal transformation technique, then you should probably consider naming a successor. 
Naruto said with an intense and yet somehow calm and composed tone and aura. Sarutobi's eyes once again darkening as he stared at the blonde Uzumaki with scrutiny. He couldn't believe it. If the implications of what Naruto was telling him were true, then did that mean that the childish, loving, innocent, and naive Uzumaki Naruto that he thought he knew had been a mask all of this time? Had he been played and manipulated the whole time by the blonde Uzumaki, him, the professor, the god of shinobi? How was that even possible? And if it was, then had he really slipped that much over the years? Or was the blonde Uzumaki just that good? Was this the Kyuubi's doing? Had Naruto somehow made contact with it? Was it in control of him? Was it manipulating him? There were just too many questions, and Hiruzen was sure that, given how the conversation was going right now, that there was no way that he would get the answers from the blonde Uzumaki by simply asking him, and even if he could, he wouldn't be able to trust any of those answers unless he could somehow verify them. Midarashi Anko and Marino Ibiki were not an option, at least not yet. If he used them, he would then have to move Naruto from them straight into the root program because otherwise there would be no more trust or any love left between him and the young Jinchuriki after such an ordeal. He would have no choice but to submit Naruto into root for conditioning. There was another option of course, they could have tried to use Yamanaka and Noichi to do the interrogation. However, there was probably an even greater risk with that tactic. Hiruzen could still vividly remember the effects of the mind transfer technique on a Jinchuriki from the time that a member of the Yamanaka clan had attempted the jutsu on Uzumaki Kushina during the Chunin exams all those years ago. Needless to say, the results were less than desirable, far from it. It could be attempted if Naruto's seal could be temporarily locked tight, but he'd have to get Jiraiya for that and even then, there were no guarantees as even his student had only the most basic of understanding regarding the seal's mechanics. Sometimes Hiruzen wondered if Minato hadn't used such a complicated seal intentionally specifically to prevent everyone else from tempering with the seal. Nevertheless, I still have to contact Jiraiya and get him to make contact with Naruto-kun. My relationship with Naruto-kun seems to be irretrievable. I doubt I can ever fully trust Naruto-kun again. However, all that is needed is to keep him in line at least long enough for him to sire an heir, and then we can start all over again. Hiruzen thought with a deep pain in his heart at the realization that he might one day have to order the death of someone he once considered to be a surrogate grandson of sorts, to get rid of Minato-kun's legacy although he would take solace in the fact that he wouldn't allow Minato's bloodline to die off as he would wait for Naruto to produce an heir. Although the wait was mostly due to the need of the bloodline of his successor slash predecessor's wife more than Minato's own, otherwise they would have nobody who could reliably contain the Kyuubi. Tell me Naruto-kun, how long have you been deceiving me? Hiruzen asked as he leaked a lot of killing intent at the blonde Uzumaki, who didn't seem all that phased at all to be honest, as if nothing had changed at all. Nowhere near as long as you have been deceiving me apparently. Unless you actually expect me to believe that half-assed story you told me about why you never told me about the Kyuubi, Naruto retorted in an attempt to shrink the width of Hiruzen's suspicions about him. As he wanted Hiruzen to keep on believing that the cause for the friction between the two of them was all about the events of two days ago. What other possible reason could I have had? Hiruzen diverted skillfully, trying to get Naruto to tell him what his own thoughts were on the matter so that he could counter them, as he didn't want to be caught red-handed in a lie by giving a response only to find out that it was a trap or a trick question. You tell me. Naruto retorted. You know I could have you arrested and interrogated if I so pleased? Surely Naruto-kun you don't expect me to believe that you also learned the earth release, double suicide decapitating technique from the forbidden scroll of seals do you? Because I can assure you that that technique is not in that scroll, Hiruzen said with mirth in his tone and expression, not the kind of friendly and carefree mirth one would expect between grandfather to grandson, but the kind of malicious and threatening kind you would expect between two enemies. If you think I am afraid of measly jail time or interrogation for that matter then you are even more of a fool than I thought. I have no friends and no family, no one that is going to cry or miss me when I am gone. Do your worst, Hokage Dano, Naruto said as he put his hands together and extended his arms out. You can arrest me any time now, Naruto said casually, as if arrest and interrogation were nothing of consequence to him. To say Hiruzen was dumbfounded would amount to the greatest understatement in the history of the shinobi world. He knew that the Naruto he thought he knew was unpredictable, brash and bold, but this Naruto took it to a whole other level entirely, an incomprehensible level. Everything that Naruto did and every response that the blonde Uzumaki gave was the complete opposite of what Hiruzen expected, clearly the standard methods of manipulation and intimidation were not going to work on the young Jinchuriki, and Hiruzen was finally beginning to understand that now. However, he is overconfident and seems to think of himself as invincible, and that will be his downfall. Hiruzen thought with an ever more painful heart as he realized that Naruto was beginning, no, was already on the path that his former prized student Orochimaru had followed. Except this time he wasn't going to make the same mistake that he made with Orochimaru, even if he had to kill him, though he held hope that it wouldn't have to come to that, 
At least he had caught on to the problem early enough to do something about it this time, or so he thought. What else did you never mind? You are dismissed naruto Kun, and you are not to go back to the academy. You are to go home and await further instruction. The same instructions have been relayed to your team. Haruzan ordered, deciding that any further questioning, unless via thorough interrogation, was practically meaningless. It was clear that Naruto would either outright lie or avoid the question completely. He also wouldn't put it past the blonde Uzumaki to just blatantly refuse to answer the question. Playing intimidation and manipulation games and playing the grandfather figure role was no longer a viable strategy any longer. Now was the time for the shinobi and him to come to the fore. It was now time for him to employ the shinobi tactics that uncovered Danzo's root program, the Uchiha Coop, and Orochimaru's treachery. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That was really stupid, Nijen. The deep, dark voice of the Kyubi reverberated in the blonde Uzumaki's head as he read his favorite manga on the sofa. You think? Naruto replied without a care in the world. Your arrogance will be your downfall. You really think that wrinkled old monkey will let this go without a fight? You are not a person to him. You're nothing but a potential weapon for the village. The village's main asset should war break out. He will do whatever it takes to keep hold of you, and if he realizes that he can't, he will kill you. Kyuubi said as if he was talking down to a child, which technically is exactly what he was doing. I know all of that. In fact, it is exactly what I am counting on. If I had kept my mask on, I would have risked falling to the same fate as the Uchiha clan. They were eliminated because they did not know that their enemy had already caught on to their schemes and were already making plans to get rid of them. From what I hear from Kabuto, Orochimaru almost fell to the same fate and only got lucky because the Hokage lost his balls when the moment of action came. History shows that this whole putting on a mask thing doesn't work on the Hokage, probably because he has the best mask of them all with that fake grandfather thing of his he does and therefore knows how to identify and expose one Naruto trailed off so that the information could sink into his partner by circumstance. By revealing myself the way I did, I have put myself in a position where I not only know my enemy and his awareness of my existence, but can also control his actions until I am ready to make my move. Also, now that he knows that I won't fall for his little games, he will no longer be inclined to call me in for questioning, he will rather try to hide in the shadows like the shinobi that he is and employ the tactics that I have already been planning for over the last five years. It also helps that I will no longer have to restrict myself on missions as much as I would have had to had I still kept on the mask. Of course I won't reveal everything I can do, but I also won't have to put myself in as much risk as I would have had to had I kept the mask of complete weakness and stupidity. Naruto explained to his partner, not that he trusted the Kyubi mind you, just that he knew that the guy literally had no one to snitch to. That sounds like a well thought out plan, though I can't help but think that it's all just a big ball of turd that you're using to excuse the fact that you're just plain tired of being the stupid and weak little shit that you've had to be all this time. Not that there's that much of a difference between the real you and that stupid mask mind you, the QB said as malicious laughter reverberated around Naruto's mindscape, though it honestly could have been just amusement as far as Naruto could tell, because the fur ball sounded like evil incarnate no matter what mood he was supposedly in. He, he, he. You're full of shit you know that. HN. Don't project yourself onto me you puny hairless monkey. Knock knock knock. Coming, Naruto exclaimed as he closed his manga book, a curious frown etched on his facial features as he moved towards the door, sensing the last chakra signature he would have expected to show up at his doorstep. That's Karinai sensei's chakra I wonder what she wants. Maybe she wants to talk about what happened at the graduation ceremony? Naruto wondered as he unlocked and opened the door to his apartment, feigning surprise when he saw the red-eyed beauty at his door even though he'd sensed her chakra of course wanting to keep the secret of his chakra sensing abilities for as long as possible. Karinai-sensei? What are you doing here? Naruto asked with a very convincing act, not a surprise considering he'd had a whole five-year experience of acting and sneaking around with Kabuto. Greetings to you too Naruto-san, and thank you for kindly inviting me into your abode so that we can have a decent conversation like two civilized people. Karinai greeted with an emotionless stare, Naruto immediately getting a small taste of the reason behind her reputation as the Ice Princess of Kanoha. There's nothing civilized about someone who deceives, manipulates, cheats, and kills for a living. However, for you, I'll make an exception. Please come in, Kurinaiheim, Naruto said with a small bow as he moved to the side to let his goddess-like superior in, a small, almost invisible shade of red appearing on each of Kurinai's cheeks as her eyes widened slightly, though she was very quick to regain her bearings as she let herself in. Kurinai-sensei is far more acceptable, let's keep things professional shall we, Kurinai said once she was inside not even turning around to look at the blonde Uzumaki as she looked around the blonde Uzumaki's apartment, surprised to see just how neat it was, especially for an unruly boy like her current host was supposed to be. Not even single item, apart from one single manga, out of place in the apartment. You're right. 
I apologize, I didn't mean to come off as someone so shallow. However, please, make yourself comfortable, sit anywhere you like, Naruto said hospitably. Karinai deciding not to take the couch as that would create more a friendly and intimate atmosphere as opposed to the rigid and purely professional one she would have by sitting on the stiff chair in Naruto's kitchen slash dining room. Would you prefer water juice or sake, Naruto offered. You drink sake, Karinai asked with a surprised and almost affronted facial expression, unable to believe that someone so young would already be a drinker though now that she thought about it, it would explain how he got the guts to pull off all of the insane stunts and pranks he had pulled over the years. Oh no. I don't like having no control of my cognitive faculties, not even for a split second. Though having said that, I have experimented on more than one occasion and found that it doesn't affect me no matter how much I drink, probably because of you know what Naruto trailed off as he looked directly into Karinai's eyes. As if searching her soul for an item that was supposed to be hidden inside of it, something that had become a habit of his due to the animosity that he had seen in so many people in the village, even the ones that pretended to be kind to him though finding nothing of the sort in Karinai's eyes beyond a slight widening of the eyes in surprise. Whether at the fact that he couldn't get drunk, or the mention of his tenant being another matter entirely. That's interesting, definitely a boon for a shinobi, though there will be times you might curse your unholy alcohol resistance, Karinai said eventually. I doubt it, Naruto retorted. So which is it? Water, sake, or juice? Nothing, Karinai cut in swiftly. I won't be staying long. I only came here to invite you to a dinner that I am organizing for tonight. It is a dinner to celebrate this year's graduation class, and naturally. Also for the purpose of creating a link or bond between the different teams as there is no doubt in my mind that we will be called upon to collaborate our efforts for missions at some point in the future. Karinai said stoically. I see. Well, I'd be honored to attend your dinner, Karinai-sensei. But I'm afraid I won't be able to attend. You see I failed the examination test at Kakashi-sensei. No you didn't, Karinai cut in again. Sorry? Naruto asked with a quirked eyebrow. I just came from the hospital. Kakashi was barely awake, but Hokage-sama was able to get the verdict out of him before he was sedated. You passed the test Naruto. Kakashi was impressed that all three of you were willing to sacrifice your opportunity to graduate so that you can remain together. That was the whole point of the test, to see how far you would go for your comrades, to see if you would throw them under the wagon for your own self-interest or risk everything for each other. Congratulations, you are now officially a genin of Konoha though one has to wonder if you really are a genin given that you just apparently easily defeated one of our legendary shinobi, Karinai said with an intense stare at the blonde Uzumaki. Perhaps I did overdo it a little, everyone will be on my ass from now on, Naruto thought to himself. He let his guard down, and besides, he didn't even use his Sharingan, Naruto tried to excuse. Indeed, however, a shinobi of his caliber shouldn't have had to have his guard up against a fresh out of the academy genin. I saw a replay of the fight in Hokage-sama's crystal ball, all of the jonin did Naruto-san. Needless to say, you have caused quite a stir in the shinobi ranks, some are calling you a genius, and others are Karinai trailed off as she stopped herself abruptly, realizing that it might be a bad idea to finish off that sentence. Blaming the Kyubi? Naruto asked curiously, Karinai's silence and aversion of eye contact more than enough to confirm his suspicions. They think you are under the influence of the beast, but I don't think so. I've always known that there was more to you than meets the eye, though that was thanks to Nevermind. Thanks to Hinata Dano, Naruto asked curiously, Karinai quite surprised by Naruto's formal and respectful manner in which he addressed his secret admirer. Why you? You know about her feelings for you? Karinai asked with a mixture of anger and suspicion, almost like a mother hen in position to strike against a predator after her offspring, or like an older sister protecting a younger sibling. I am aware of her interest in me. I wasn't quite sure that she had those kind of feelings for me, though I was curious to find out why not only a Byakugan wielder but an heiress of the Hyuga main house felt the need to spy on me almost 24-7. I never imagined it would turn out to be something simple and straightforward like that. Makes a whole lot of sense now though Naruto trailed off thoughtfully, also aware that said Hyuga heiress was in fact watching them even now from a safe distance away that was still within her visual range, and also within his sensing range. I see. I was under the impression that you knew. I thought that that might be the reason why you argued so passionately during the graduation ceremony that you should be switched with Kiba so that you can join my team. I thought that you felt the same way about her, Karinai said with a somewhat down and almost disappointed tone. I can see that you care deeply for her, and I'm sorry if this offends you, but I don't actually know how I feel about her. I don't know her at all on a personal level and all this time I thought that she was a Hyuga spy or something, so I was actually a little scared of her. I wanted to join your team so that I can get closer to her and find out what exactly was up, though it is true what I said about wanting to learn from you to make up for my weakness in Genjutsu. It's also true that I have a scent tracking ability to rival the Inazuka clan and that I didn't want to be in the same team as Uchiha Sasuke, Naruto replied earnestly. I see. 
Well, thank you for your honesty at least. I know this is none of my business but is there someone that you are interested in? Besides Sakura-san of course? Karina asked curiously. You want to determine if Hinata Dano has any rivals for my affections? Naruto asked with a quirked eyebrow. It's just a cue okay yes. Karina admitted shamefully. Well I think you are the only one she might have to worry about. Otherwise there's no one else that has caught my interest. Naruto replied casually. As if speaking merely about the weather forecast. W what? Karina stuttered. Don't be so surprised. You're a very beautiful woman. And as if that were not enough you're a powerful jonin and you use perfect combination of elegance, class, and sex appeal. You also have this mysterious aura and you seem to be, from a distance at least, a very unapproachable and intimidating figure, which only makes you all the more appealing. Hinata Donowell, I don't know much about her, but she's also beautiful and she is royalty with a powerful bloodline, and will likely grow even more beautiful over the years and become a better kunoichi as she gains confidence and masters her bloodline. She has a good shot too, though in all honesty. Both of you are out of my league so I don't even know what I'm thinking saying all of this stuff, Naruto said as he scratched the back of his head sheepishly. Aren't you being a little too honest? Karina asked, completely baffled and yet strangely endeared by the blonde Uzumaki appreciation of her, and of course his blunt honesty, as Karina was in fact a blunt honest person herself and therefore had an appreciation for people who returned the favor. Really? Huh I guess I wouldn't really know. I don't exactly have friends or anything like that and I never had parents to teach me that kind of stuff. But thanks Karinai-sensei, I get the feeling that you've taught me something important today, Naruto said with a genuine smile, a little of his mask slipping in as the innocent and naive boy facade slipped onto his face on its own accord, probably a result of having practiced with it and used it for so long. It's um it's a pleasure, Karinai trailed off with a sad look in her eyes, just now realizing how sad and lonely Naruto's life must have been, and still probably is. But there are issues of concern, like for instance, how did you know that I was known as the Genjutsu Mistress of Konoha? No academy student should have had access to that kind of information. Karina asked with a deadly glare. Ah, uh, so this is what she was really after. I wonder if she came of her own accord of if the Hokage sent her? Has the cat and mouse game already begun? Naruto thought with a weird combination of weariness and excitement. I stole a bingo book from a drunk jonin. This is the red light district after all. And I am the great Uzumaki Naruto databayo. Naruto said in a manner remission of his idiot mask, except without much of the idiot part. I see Karina trailed off suspiciously. You doubt my greatness? Naruto asked with a mischievous smile. Do I doubt that an academy student could outweed a jonin and actually take his possessions without him or her being the wiser? Yes. But you were never an ordinary academy student, were you? You are after all, the great Uzumaki Naruto who managed to defile the Hokage monument right under the noses of a military dictator and all of his soldiers and guards stole the forbidden scroll of seals, defeated and killed your evil chunin instructor and hospitalized your jonin sensei without sustaining any injuries to yourself. Karina said almost word for word to the Hokage when he was updating them on all matters concerning Uzumaki Naruto just recently. Well when you put it like that ee hee Naruto laughed sheepishly. Hmm I'll be on my way then. It was nice speaking to you Naruto-san, and thank you for your hospitality. I look forward to seeing you tonight, Karina said as she got up to leave. It was nice of you to pay me a visit. I hope there will be many more of those in the future. Naruto said as he walked the Ice Queen of Konoha to the door. I'm not sure how much my boyfriend, Jonin Saratobi Asuma would take to the idea of me regularly paying visits in other man's apartment. Karina said as she turned to look at the blonde Uzumaki directly in the eyes when she was just outside of his apartment, exactly where she looked down at him when he first opened the door for her. Creating almost a sense of deja vu. Surely a powerful and experienced man like him, with such a rich heritage and family background, wouldn't be insecure enough to feel threatened by a no-name wet behind the ear genin. Naruto retorted with an almost predatory smile, causing shivers to run up and down Karina's spine, though whether those were shivers of fear and disgust or of arousal and attraction, even she could not tell. Be that as it may, it would be inappropriate. I'll see you tonight at the dinner, Karina said before turning and walking away before the blonde Uzumaki could reply, wanting to get as far away from him as possible not because she didn't want to continue to talk to him, and not because she didn't enjoy his presence but actually she enjoyed his company far too much, much more than she was comfortable with. Naruto was blunt honest with her, told her exactly how he felt, and why he felt that way. He wasn't scared of her like most potential suitors and wasn't only interested in her looks as proven by his apology for coming off as shallow when he called her a princess because of her outward appearance. And the fact that he wanted her to teach him genjutsu, which only proved that he recognized her skill as a kunoichi, something that was rare in the shinobi world, particularly amongst male ninja. The burden that he carried, the tortured soul that he was and how he handled said pain and burdens, and even his playful and trickster-like personality, 
a contrast to hers yet ever more attractive to her as a result, all of these things about him only served to enhance his appeal as a suitor. However, he was less than half her age, and he was now considered to be a flight risk by the higher authorities. There was also the fact that he was Hinata's one true love and her almost sole ambition in life, and Karinai herself was Hinata's sister figure and best friend, and had also made it her own goal to help Hinata snag Naruto one day. If Kurinai dated Naruto, Hinata's self-confidence would suffer irreconcilable damage, and their bond would be forever shattered. Kurinai would be a traitor not only to Hinata but also to her boyfriend Asuma and then there was also the stigma attached to Naruto because of his Jinchuriki status that would become a shadow hovering over their relationship, and even their children if things got that far. Besides, Kurinai didn't think this could be anything more than a childish crush that Naruto had on her, perhaps because she was already fully developed as a woman just like the prostitutes, strippers and skanks that Naruto was undoubtedly used to seeing given the location of his apartment, whereas his academy peers were still well. Getting an introduction to puberty. Nevertheless, she would consider teaching him all about Genjutsu if the Hokage extended her mission beyond the brief inquiry that she had just had with the blonde Uzumaki. And she would find that out very soon as she was on her way to report her findings and try to give the Hokage as accurate a profile as she could conjure in the limited interactions that she'd had with young Jinchuriki. 0000000000000000000 Naichan, you're back. So how did it go with the Naruto's profiling? Saratobi Asuma asked the question that was meant to be asked by his dad, though Haruzen didn't mind as he wanted all of them to hear what she had to say anyway. Karinai had been chosen not only because of Naruto's vehement protests that he be transferred to her team two days ago, and not only because he had cited his weakness for Genjutsu as part of the reason he wanted to join her team, information he should not have known about her mind you but also because she in fact was employed as a profiler for the torture and interrogation unit by trade on a part-time basis, which is how she and Anko became friends in the first place. Her unusual but exceptional mastery and specialization in Genjutsu made her a master of the mind, and she had an exceptional ability, as a result, when it came to profiling. This information was also excluded from the bingo book as her profiling expertise and part-time and BU employment was virtually unknown. It went well. It turns out that you have a rival for my affections, Karina said stoically, Asuma, Haruzen, and Guy's jaws hitting the floor in astonishment, and Kakashi's mask slipping off momentarily so that his jaw could extend to his crotch without tearing the mask. To his crotch and not the floor of course because he was seated on his hospital bed, supported by cushions on his back, the meeting taking place in his hospital room as he couldn't exactly leave the hospital in his condition. W what? Did that brat do something perver? Nothing like that. He thought that Hinata follows him around because she is a Hyuga spy sent after him, he didn't know about her affections. When the topic came up, I used the opportunity to find out if Hinata-chan has any rivals for his affections, and it turns out she does. Karina explained, not that it helped to alleviate the shock and perplexity of the situation. The Brad is consistently ambitious if not anything else, wants the highest honor and title in the village and to date the most beautiful woman in the village while at it. I'd be impressed if I thought he stood a chance. Asuma retorted with an amused and definitely cocky smirk. He believes that both Hinata and I are out of his league, and I made it clear to him that I am already taken. Nevertheless, his romantic life is not particularly the point of our investigation, is it? Kurinai retorted. On the contrary, all information is relevant and important, especially his romantic aspirations. It would help me sleep better if Naruto-kun were in an intimate relationship with a loyal and trusted Kunoichi such as yourself, Haruzen said as he stroked his beard. Hey watch it old man, Asuma exclaimed furiously. I'm not suggesting that Kurinai-san should seduce Naruto-kun, nor am I suggesting she should marry him and produce an heir, she is after all already spoken for Saratobi trailed off darkly, the message loud and clear to all the jonin present, that he would have already ordered it with Kurinai not in a relationship with his son, and of course. That he could still order it anyway if he so wished, Asuma gritting his teeth furiously at his dad, once again being reminded why they didn't, and would never get along again with his father. It would however be unwise to make an order without getting all the information, how about we start by letting Kurinai-san impart to us Naruto's profile. Kakashi suggested, skillfully halting the father-son clash that was about to transpire, a clash he was confident that Asuma would not win anyway, whether it was verbal or physical in nature, Kurinai not waiting for confirmation from the Hokage as she also wanted the marriage and seduction talk to go as far away from her as possible. He is an egomaniac, very confident in himself and his abilities. He has emotional scars that make him vulnerable, but he is also the type that will readily use those vulnerabilities to manipulate others and further his own ambitions. He is not afraid of anything and that makes him a big risk taker, but he will also only take calculated risks and will plan a few steps ahead of enemies without the appearance of doing so. In other words, he plans far ahead but his methods put him at a great risk, partially because he is an adrenaline junkie but also because he is confident in his ability to rise to the occasion. 
He has a lot of love and compassion, but only for those he deems worthy of it, he is likely cruel and uncompromising to his enemies, but will show mercy if he sees an opportunity to turn foe into ally, or to use said foe in some degree to further his own ambitions. Karina said as she took a breath, carefully watching the reactions of her audience thus far, not surprised to see the shock, confusion, and fear in their eyes, probably none of them able to comprehend the fact that this was a psychological profile of Naruto. His personality overall resonates with that of the mythical trickster. He loves to have fun, to prank people, to confuse people, to toy with people, and to manipulate people, and his actions, at first glance, do not seem to have a clear goal beyond causing chaos and having a good time, but there is always an agenda. In almost each and every action taken, he is either cruel nor kind, either good nor evil, he just is. He does however show signs of loyalty and extreme hatred for betrayal. Friends and allies will see him as a benevolent, merciful, loving, and compassionate being, enemies will see him as evil incarnate, a harbinger of destruction. That is the Uzumaki Naruto I met today, Karinai concluded, an expected but uncomfortable silence taking hold of the hospital room, everyone locked deep within their minds as they meditated over Karinai's words, Hiruzen the first one to break out of his musings as he had a few questions for the Genjutsu mistress. That was a very detailed profile considering that you spent but only a few moments with him Hiruzen trailed off in a purely inquiring manner, trying to understand how exactly Karinai was able to gather enough information to produce such a detailed profile. You have to use all the information you have on a subject in order to compile an accurate profile. I had information about Naruto dating back to as far as he was just a little child, from what everyone in the village knows about him, from one of my students. Hiba Hinata's interactions with him and her innocent but useful daily spy sessions on him, from the events of two days ago, and from the events of today up to and until I left his apartment. I also factored in the information that you recently shared with us about his heritage. Karina explained patiently. Haruzen not knowing whether to be proud or weary of her given how brilliant she seemed to be at her job, because he didn't even want to think about what her profile of him would look like. I see, but speaking of his heritage, do you think that Naruto-kun has become aware of the secrets that have been kept from him? Haruzen asked curiously, the other jonin widening their eyes at the implications of what the Hokage was asking, because if Naruto had become aware of it on his own, or if someone had made him aware of it, and done it in a way that would paint the Hokage and the higher-ups in bad taste then it could explain a lot of things about Naruto's recent behavior. Unlikely, as he considers both Hinata and I to be women that are acres above his own league. The son of the fourth Hokage and an Uzumaki princess, who also recently defeated a legendary jonin would have a bit more self-worth than that. However it is not impossible that he does know and simply has a different criteria for judging leagues in the romantic sense, especially considering his social background. It is therefore something that is unlikely but should be taken into consideration. We are dealing with a socially dysfunctional trickster after all. Karina answered clearly, and concisely as usual. I apologize for speaking out of term Hokage-sama, but I have a question I wish to pose to Karina sensei Guy asked with his game face, a rare expression on the otherwise goofy and eccentric jonin, one that merited the utmost seriousness and consideration. You may all speak freely Gaikuin, we are in this together. Hiruzen answered. What do you want to know? Karina asked curiously. Do you think it is possible that young Naruto-kun was working together with Mizuki to steal the Forbidden Scroll of Seals? Do you think he has a secret tutor or mentor, and do you think that he learned more than the Shadow Clone and its variations from the Forbidden Scroll? Guy asked curiously, posing questions that were really scary to consider and yet surprisingly valid, especially coming from him, everyone looking to Karinai with bated breath to find out what she had to say on the matter. Based on the video footage that we saw on the Crystal Ball regarding the events of that day, I can't see how it is possible that he learned more than the Shadow Clone. We saw him practice the technique for two hours, and we saw him read the information about it, and probably its variations too since it was all on the same section. However, he never extended the scroll any further nor did he make copies of the material, so it is highly improbable as far as I can tell. Karina said as she took another breath before continuing. As far as working with Mizuki is concerned, Naruto killed him so there is no further information we can get from him. It is however entirely possible that Naruto has a private tutor or mentor of sorts, but he won't reveal the identity of said person. His explanation that he spied on a jonin on the training grounds and learned the earth style, double decapitation from spying on him is quite frankly ridiculous and unbelievable. Karina explained. Do you think Danzo could be this private tutor? Kakashi asked curiously. Unlikely. He doesn't fit the profile of any of Danzo's associates. Danzo is an extremist and a Kanoha loyalist. Naruto seems to have loyalties only to himself and those close to him. Danzo does everything he does for the sake of Kanoha and his obsession with the Hokage seat. Naruto, while in the past having appeared to have an equal obsession with the seat, seems to only do everything either for the fun of it, simply because he can, or for himself and those closest to him. 
Naruto also doesn't display any of the characteristics of a root agent. Kurinai replied. If he only does things that will benefit him, or those closest to him, then do you think that he would become loyal to Konoha if those people closest to him were loyal to Konoha themselves? Hiruzen asked curiously. Possibly, but it would have to be at least more than three people. One or two might not be enough. Kurinai replied. Perhaps four then? Hiruzen asked as he directed his gaze at the copy ninja, everybody getting exactly what he was implying, as Kakashi was now in charge of a four-men cell that included the blonde Uzumaki though that still would leave one more slot to fill for the fourth precious person for the blonde Uzumaki. I'll do my best. He was willing to give up his bells so that Sakura and Sasuke can graduate, and he hated that I tried to make them tear each other to shreds to get a promotion. There might be some hope still. Kakashi replied with more hope than conviction, but hope was all any of them could do right now. I will send a message to Jiraiya and ask him to return, maybe he can help somehow, both as a master spy and as a person who is close to his parents and of course as the fourth close person he would have, though I do expect you and your genin teams to make an effort too, Gaikuin, Asuma, Kurinai-chan Haruzen trailed off. That shouldn't be a problem, but I also think that Jiraiya should let him sign the toad contract, that way he wouldn't be able to defect even if he wanted to, Asuma suggested. That's a good idea, but it is up to Jiraiya, I can't force him or the toads to accept Naruto as a summoner, Haruzen explained. What about Kakashi's dog contract then? He said he had sensed sensing rivaling that of the Inazuka, right? Wouldn't the dog summon be appealing to him? Asuma asked as he stared at the bedridden Jonin inquisitively. I can't do that. I don't want to appear to have favoritism towards Naruto, especially now that he has already proven himself to be a cut above the others. It could screw up team dynamics badly. I'm already anticipating a tough time sorting that out already. Kakashi replied. Kakashi kun is right. The situation with Sasuke kun and Naruto kun being in the same team is already volatile enough. We don't need to make it worse. Just remember to keep a keen eye on both of those two, and do your best to get them to open up and bond with their peers. I'll call you in from time to time so that we may share intel and decide whether extra precautions are necessary or not. Until then, you are all dismissed. End chapter. Chapter 2. The Ant King. One month later. It had been just over a month since the day that he had garnered a serious reputation in the village for defeating the copy ninja, though many in the village still thought that it was either a fluke or a freak incident that can only happen once in lifetime. Not many people willing to believe that the dead last idiotic prankster was capable of such a feat, especially his fellow Jen and compatriots, many of which were still under the influence of the thorough beatings they had given to him at the academy whenever they sparred. There were however dark whispers and rumors spreading amongst some shinobi force, talks of the possibility that the Kyuubi brat was possibly collaborating with the demon inside of him, or even more troubling, that he had already been taken over by the beast. Other than that, not much had happened since then and Naruto was disgusted with Kabuto for failing to tell him how ridiculous deranked missions were. If he didn't owe Kabuto so much for all he had done for him, Naruto wasn't sure he would have been able to stop himself from strangling the bespectacled medic to death with his bare hands. Speaking of the bespectacled teen, Naruto was quite disappointed that Kabuto hadn't been able to broker the deal that Naruto had wanted from the snake Sanin in exchange for his services regarding the improvement of the curse seal and the Edo Tensei. The snake Sanin citing that the mere act of allowing Naruto to help him was payment enough as Naruto would get access to two of the Sanin's prized jutsu in exchange for his help. Naruto had wanted payment in the form of the corpse or live body of the DNA material used for the curse seal, Senju Tobarama's corpse, and also Senju Hashirama's corpse. It was a lot to ask for admittedly, but Naruto had been hopeful. His request for Senju Hashirama and the corpse or live body of the guy whose name he now knew as Jugo was swiftly rejected. Orochimaru would not part with Jugo dead or alive, and he would also not part with Senju Hashirama's corpse. Kabuto did however manage to broker a watered-down version of the deal where Naruto would get Senju Tobarama and Senju Toka's corpses in exchange for his services, and a small sample of Jugo's DNA that he would need anyway in order to help make improvements on the curse seal. The improvements were going quite well, he was already done making improvements to the Edo Tensei, and was almost done with the curse seal too. Orochimaru was pleased with the work done on the Edo Tensei, and was impatiently nagging him to complete the Cursed Seal improvements too, though it was hard to tell Pale Sanin's mood given that they had not actually met face to face and only communicated through Kabuto and Orochimaru's snakes at times. In any case, it seemed like Orochimaru would have to wait a while still for the Cursed Seal improvements as Sasuke had just rudely expressed his refusal to do another useless deranked mission, practically ordering the Hokage to give him something that wouldn't be another waste of time. Sakura was shocked by the outburst, though hard to really call it an outburst as Sasuke's tone seemed as even as it usually was though there was an edge of clear irritation in it. Naruto on the other hand was relieved, because at least it didn't have to be him to do it, because God knows that every single move he made was being scrutinized lately, 
even something as simple as blowing his nose would probably be deemed as reason enough to interrogate him at this point. Though in hindsight, I guess blowing my nose would be just cause for suspicion seeing as I've never contracted any sicknesses such as the flu in my entire life before. Naruto thought amusedly. Sasuke. Show some respect for the Hokage. It's quite all right Kakashi-kun. Truthfully speaking, if not today, then certainly within the week I was already considering giving them a higher ranked mission. Naruto-kun's shadow clone technique, while convenient, has made the issue of a deranked mission quite literally pointless. Haruzen said as he pulled out a brown folder with the letter C on the outside. H. Hokage-sama. Are you sure you're not being a little too hasty? Iruka asked with concern. Not at all. They are ready for the mission. The deranked missions are too easy to fulfill their purpose because of Naruto-kun's ability to clone himself. Perhaps a more difficult mission will be more suited to force them to work together and thereby develop their teamwork. Haruzen explained. I see, but I still don't think that they're ready, Iruka muttered under his breath. It's not your decision to make any more, Iruka. They are no longer academy students, they are shinobi of Kanahigaku no Sado, Kakashi said harshly, causing Iruka to swallow a lump as he shrank back into himself, realizing quickly that he had slightly overextended his reach just now. It was at that moment that Haruzen called in the next client, which turned out to be a smelly old drunk who was also quite rude, brazenly insulting Kakashi's students and even Kakashi himself whom the old drunk didn't think looked like much for someone who was supposed to be an elite shinobi. Nevertheless Kakashi was quick to warn him not to judge a book by its cover, though the old man, who introduced himself as Tazuna the bridge builder, did not seem entirely convinced. Nevertheless, Kakashi ordered his students to pack for a long-term mission and meet him at the main gate in 45 minutes, instructing Tazuna to also do the same as the Hokage asked that Kakashi should remain behind for a moment as he and the copy ninja left the hall and headed to the safety of his office. What did you want to talk about, Hokage-sama? Kakashi asked almost as soon as they entered the Hokage's office, unable to take the suspense anymore. It's been a month now, I would like a progress report on all things regarding Sasuke-kun and Naruto-kun too of course, especially Naruto-kun. Haruzen asked with his hands locked together, staring at the copy ninja from across his desk with an intense but also weary expression. A heavy sigh escaping the copy ninja's throat as he answered the dreaded question. Nothing new as far as Sasuke is concerned. He still harbors no respect or consideration for Sakura, and in fact attempts to stay as far away from her as possible and to minimize contact with her as much as he can when he has to be around her. Teamwork drills have been going well, but only on a professional level. Naruto has somehow instilled a strictly professional attitude within the team by calling on the reputation of the other two as the Rookie of the Year and Kunoichi of the Year. He did this by pointing out that all the higher-ups, other genin, and even other shinobi of higher ranking will be watching their every move from here on out, and therefore anything below the highest standard of professionalism would be a sign of weakness, and even a mockery to their status Kakashi trailed off with another heavy sigh. This is bad because? Hiruzen asked with a small frown. Under normal circumstances it wouldn't be a bad thing, but given who we're dealing with, in particular Sasuke and Naruto, too much professionalism is not necessarily a good thing, it might hinder their already subpar social skills and will create distance between them and their peers. They won't be forming any solid bonds with anyone in the village at this rate, Kakashi explained. I see. I suppose it also doesn't help that Naruto-kun insists on using his shadow clones to complete missions on his own. Still, one would have thought Sasuke-kun would be opposed to allowing the so-called dead last or anyone for that matter to do his work for him, Hiruzen mused out loud. Naruto is subtly playing on their ego. It was very easy for him to convince them that the Kunoichi of the year, and the Rookie of the year and heir to the great Achiha clan were above doing missions that equate to nothing but mundane chores that any civilian could complete on their own. He also convinced Sakura that she could spend more time with Sasuke if she allowed him to complete the D-rank missions, Kakashi said with another heavy sigh, honestly starting to regret ever even entertaining the idea of taking on a genin team, this was just not the kind of shit he needed in his life, though on the flip side. How would he face his friend Abito and his sensei when he joined them in the afterlife if he didn't even try? So in other words, you have allowed Naruto to completely take over your genin team, is that what you're telling me Kakashi-kun? Hiruzen asked furiously. Kakashi hanging his head down in shame at the Hokage's brutal assessment. It's not easy to assert your authority on someone who is as well versed on shinobi legislature as Naruto is. I tried to order that they work together as a team to get the deranked missions completed, and I even tried to ban the use of shadow clone technique on such missions, but Naruto had valid arguments against everything. Irrefutable arguments actually. Such as, Haruzen asked in frustration. The banning of using certain techniques on missions is illegal even by a superior officer unless said technique endangers either the life and or health of either the user himself or his her compatriots. There is also a rule that all shinobi should put emotions aside and take the most effective and quickest method to complete a mission. 
These two laws directly overruled any attempts I made to get them to use teamwork on deranked missions. Kakashi replied with a defeated tone, Hiruzen's eyes softening a little as he realized the sheer weight of the challenge that Kakashi was dealing with, after all. How could he judge Kakashi when one of his students was not only a traitor to the village, but an international criminal, and the other had practically disowned Konoha and by shinobi law, should have long been labeled a traitor and hunted down? Kakashi, what do you think Naruto's agenda is? Hiruzen asked with a grave undertone. Divide and conquer. He is systematically taking control away from me and molding the team in the way he best sees fit. I don't know what his end game is, but this is what is happening right now, Kakashi replied. Perhaps you should have a rematch with him when you return from your mission in Wave Country. Your loss to him may be playing a big factor in the current team dynamics. First impressions are the most important, and yours wasn't a very good one. You need to rectify that, Hiruzen ordered. I've already tried. He refuses to engage me. He forfeits as soon as the fight begins and when I order him to fight me seriously, he hides behind hundreds of shadow clones, shadow clones that do the utmost minimum to distract me and keep me busy. It's almost impossible to track down the real one. This one time I destroyed all of his clones only to find that the real one hadn't even pitched for the team meeting that day. Kakashi explained much to both his and Hiruzen's chagrin. So he is deliberately avoiding a rematch? To hide the true level of his own power and skills or to keep the stigma of your loss to him as a weight hanging around your neck? Hiruzen pondered out loud. This is too much even for Kakashi-kun to handle. Where the hell is Jiraiya when you need him? Hiruzen thought furiously. He thought he'd made it clear in the message that he sent that Jiraiya was to return to the village with immediate effect, that there was a crisis involving his godson, so where the hell was he? It shouldn't have taken more than six days for him to get back here, yet it had been over a month now since Hiruzen had sent word to him. What could be so important that he couldn't get back here any sooner? I think it is most likely both Hokage-sama. Kakashi replied, Hiruzen closing his eyes and sighing deeply as he felt a headache coming. Minato-kun, what is becoming of your son? Is this all my fault? Hiruzen thought regrettably. Don't beat yourself up, Kakashi-kun. We will get to the bottom of this no matter what it takes. We will reconvene at the completion of the C-rank mission. If nothing has changed, then your team will have to start taking B or even A-rank missions. We need to find out how much more of Naruto-kun's skills he is hiding from us, Hiruzen said authoritatively. Kakashi's eyes widening in surprise at how far the Hokage was willing to go to get to the truth, but then again, given Naruto's heritage and Jinchuriki status, he couldn't really blame the man. H. Hi, Hokage-sama, Kakashi submitted. I may have to step up Sasuke and Sakura's training if we are going to be getting B and A ranked missions, especially Sakura. Kakashi thought to himself just before a question randomly popped up in his head. Hokage-sama? Have there been any developments between Kurinai-san and Naruto? Kakashi asked as he remembered that Kurinai actually had a far better chance to get some intel on Naruto than he did, not only due to her incredible profiling skills, but also because Naruto seemed to have a crush on her and actually wanted to be tutored by her in the art of Genjutsu. No there haven't. Kurinai-chan has refused Naruto-kun's request to be tutored by her in Genjutsu. She believes that now is a crucial time for her to get to build foundations and form a bond with her genin team and that taking on an apprentice outside of her team would disrupt the relationship that she is trying to build with her genin team especially if the apprentice is another member of their graduation class. There is also the fact that Naruto already told everyone that he is a better fit for Kurinai's team than Kibakuen. If Kibakuen were to find out that Kurinai was giving private lessons to Naruto Kuen Hiruzen trailed off, leaving Kakashi to put two and two together on his own. If he had to be honest with himself, Hiruzen was kind of glad that Kurinai had refused to tutor Naruto in the art of Genjutsu. Naruto's desperation to be in Kurinai's team and his request to be tutored in the art of Genjutsu by her told Hiruzen that Naruto was very confident in his other skills, particularly the ones that Kakashi excelled in, such as ninjutsu and taijutsu. If Genjutsu was his weakness, then the last thing Hiruzen wanted was for Naruto to eradicate that weakness, at least not until he could confirm whether Naruto was a friend or foe, as right now he had no idea whatsoever. Best case scenario was that Naruto was loyal and was just a private guy who likes to hold on to his secrets tolerable but unfavorable scenario was that he was the next Danzo, and worst case scenario was that Naruto was the next Orochimaru. Hiruzen was hopeful for the best case scenario, preparing for the tolerable scenario, and dreading the worst case scenario. He often found himself wondering where he'd gone wrong, and at which point did Naruto start keeping secrets from him, or if the Naruto he thought he knew ever existed to begin with. If the latter was true, and that Naruto never existed to begin with, then Hiruzen would have to admit that he had failed monumentally and that perhaps Danzo was right every time he called him a senile old fool. I see, and I suppose Asuma wouldn't be too pleased about her dating Naruto, even if just for a little while. Kakashi inquired though deep down he already knew the answer to that question. That goes without saying unfortunately, 
Haruzan said with a heavy sigh, honestly, he was getting a little too old for this shit. He shouldn't even be sitting here at this age. Either one of Tsunade, Orochimaru, or Jiraiya should have taken this seat by now if they weren't so so full of shit. Perhaps it would have been better if Naruto had been assigned to Karinai's team after all. Kakashi said, even though he knew that there was no way they could have foreseen the troubles that they were having now, or that Karinai would have been so pivotal to resolving them. One week later, Wave Island. Naruto, Sasuke, Sakura. There's no hope for me now, and there's no way you three will be able to defeat him. Take Tazuna-san with you and run, now. His water clone should dispel if he allows it to get too far away from the main body, and his main body cannot move without cancelling this water prison, Kakashi exclaimed frantically. His students, well, two of them at least looking terribly frightened right now, but one of them, our favorite blonde Uzumaki looking calm and contemplative. Clearly undecided about what to do but also appearing to be not afraid at all. He, Your sensei is right. You should run with your tails between your legs. After all, you three are not even real ninja. By the time I was your age, I had already taken hundreds of lives. You three don't seem to be even out of your diapers yet. Zabuza taunted, Kakashi's students, namely, Sasuke and Sakura widening their eyes in disbelief at what they were hearing. He'd already killed hundreds of people by the time he was my age. That's that's, he's he's just like him. Sasuke thought with realization, a realization that was hammered into his head as Kakashi narrated the story of the origins of the demon, of the mist. Kyuso. I haven't even taken a life yet. What have I been doing all this time? Sasuke thought as he clenched his hands in frustration and anger. Zabuza is right. I'm no ninja. All I've been doing is playing ninja all this time. Itachi was already a member of the NBU at my age, and Zabuza had already killed hundreds of ninja. What have I done? Sasuke thought as he descended into the darkest pits of his heart and mind. Hey Zabuza-san? How much is your corpse worth to Kirigaku no Sato? I mean, obviously you're not going to live past this day if you're going to try and fight the great Uzumaki Naruto, strongest and smartest ninja in the elemental nations. Naruto declared confidently, Zabuza raising his non-existent eyebrows at the clearly mentally challenged blonde-haired ninja in front of him. I would have preferred to run away and let Kakashi die, and then I can switch with a shadow clone and go after Zabuza and his accomplice myself. However, what if Kakashi survives the ordeal somehow and reports my actions to the Hokage? After all, this could just as easily be a trap that he is setting for me, otherwise he would have attempted to use Raikiri already to escape the water prison. Lightning is after all, strong against water. Naruto contemplated. Heh? You're either very brave or very stupid Kozo. Either way, I give you credit for not shaking like a leaf in the face of death like your two teammates over there. Sabuza taunted. But then again, water is also a complement to lightning. If Kakashi attempts to use lightning release while he is submerged, he almost certainly will sustain some form of damage by his own technique. Zabuza, having recorded a bunch of information on Kakashi in his personal bingo book, is probably also aware of Kakashi's ability to use lightning release, and is therefore banking on the complementary elements of lightning and water to dissuade Kakashi from attempting to break out of his prison via that method. Naruto. Reasoned, but then deciding to help out nonetheless just to be on the safe side, after all, he still needed to be in Konoha up until at least Orochimaru's planned invasion. Don't be stupid Naruto. You've been acting like the team leader since this team was formed. Make the right call for your team. Get everyone out of here and protect them with everything that you have. Kakashi exclaimed frantically. Nonsense. It was Sasuke this time with an outburst, Kakashi's eyes widening in surprise at the Uchiho's reaction, especially considering that said Uchiha just recently wet his pants enough that he almost committed suicide. As Sasuke-kun? Sakura stuttered in shock. It doesn't matter if we run or not. He'll just track us down and finish us off when he's done with you. The only way we will survive is if we can get you out of that stupid prison, Sasuke said with finality. Nice thinking, Sasuke. I had thought you were an overhyped moron for a long time now. Didn't know you actually had a brain somewhere in that big head of yours. Naruto taunted. H.N. You're one to talk, though. Sasuke retorted. Sakura left fish-eyed at the scene that was transpiring right before her eyes, wondering what the hell was going on, as in how the hell were these two not wetting their pants like she was given the hopelessness of the situation. H.N. Okay, so what's your plan? Naruto asked curiously, hoping that he wouldn't have to execute the plan he had in mind as that would mean revealing yet another one of his secrets. Sasuke on the other hand faced faulting at the blonde Uzumaki's question. I assumed you had a plan considering how much of a big game you were talking. Sasuke retorted with a deep frown. Does that mean that you don't have a plan then? Dob. Sasuke ground out furiously, doing everything he could to stop himself from strangling the insufferable blonde idiot of a teammate that he had. Okay then, step back, all three of you. Naruto ordered with a no-nonsense tone and expression. Don't be stupid Naruto no baka. You can't order Sasuke-kun like that. 
And what makes you think that you can beat that monster on your own? Even Kakashi-sensei couldn't. The same Kakashi-sensei I hospitalized the day after our graduation? Naruto cut in swiftly, Zabuza's eye narrowing dangerously at those words, unable to detect even a hint of a lie from the blonde-haired Uzumaki, and honestly feeling like he was dealing with a completely different person as opposed to the idiot he was dealing with earlier. As if he was dealing with a real killer. Everybody knows that was Jay just a fluke, Sakura stammered. That girl is not faking either. It's entirely possible that they are just trying to throw me off my game, but it doesn't feel like it, my instincts are telling me otherwise. Zabuza thought as he prepared himself for anything. Fine, just know that you will both die if you get in the way, and it won't be my fault since I warned you both to step back already. Naruto, this is not the time for your stupid. Shut up and do what he says, Sakura. Sasuke said furiously, the young Uchiha grabbing Tazuna by the hand and pulling him away from the blonde Uzumaki to a safer distance, Sakura frozen in shock at her crush's actions, unable to understand why he was taking orders from Naruto Baka, and why he wasn't handling the situation himself. But at the same time too afraid of what he would do, say, and think of her if she said anything, or didn't follow his instructions, the pink-haired Kunoichi of the year reluctantly tracking back until she was in a defensive formation around the bridge builder along with her crush. He's going to be pissed off at me for this, but I don't have much of a choice. Naruto thought as a he bit his thumb and placed his right hand on the ground. Kuchios no jutsu. Naruto whispered as a relatively large cloud of smoke appeared, the smoke clearing out in a few moments to reveal, much to everyone's surprise, what appeared to be a humanoid monster insect. It's been a long time, Miriam Dano. Naruto greeted with a serious tone, knowing quite well that his summon, the king of the chimera ants, didn't appreciate anything but the utmost seriousness, and would punish others violently for behavior that was to the contrary though he wouldn't dare attempt such a thing to someone who was not only his summoner, but his and his brethren's creator, the Chimera and clan being the product of the initial experiments that culminated in Naruto's Chimera no Jutsu, a Jutsu that Naruto was currently using to recruit members for his secret organization. An organization known simply as the Bloodline. The Chimera ants, Miriam and his brethren, originate from a special type of ant species that exists in the forest of demon country known as Swindler's Forest. The ants in that area are extremely large compared to normal ants, growing up to the size of a large dog at their peak, and that attribute, along with their hard exoskeletons, their super strength, being that ants can lift more than ten times their own weight, and the speed and agility of that ant species in particular, are the reasons why Naruto had chosen them as the focus of his experiments. Naruto had wanted to use his chimera technique to give the ants the strongest attributes of other species, and see what would happen, if he could create the ultimate summon or animal partner. When he realized that he could actually give them the attributes of other species, he had wondered if it was possible to give them some human attributes. After all, based on interactions with some of Orochimaru's snakes that had delivered messages to Kabuto and recently to him, summons seemed to have human intelligence and even speech, therefore. He concluded, it would be to his and the benefit of his summons if they too had human intelligence and speech, which is why Naruto had started fusing human DNA into his test subjects in order to create the ultimate summoning species, which had been a monumental success to say the least. King Nuriam being the poster boy for Naruto's accomplishments. In any case, the success with the Chimera species is what had opened the door for Naruto to refine the Chimera no Jutsu so that he could use it to endow himself and his comrades with powerful bloodline limits by fusing the corpses of bloodline users with his comrades. However, Naruto himself was not directly benefiting from his hard work as the Kyuubi and the Kyuubi seal itself was an obstacle he had yet to find his way around in order to use the Chimera no Jutsu on himself, although his brothers and sisters of the bloodline were getting all the benefits which was more than Naruto could ask for right now as he too was reaping the fruits of his labor, albeit indirectly. Indeed it has, Naruto-sama. Maruam replied with a calm and composed tone, an air of nobility and confidence easily identifiable in his tone and demeanor. He is a relatively short guy who looks like a cross between an ant, a human, and a scorpion, particularly with that large tail that is equipped with a stinger protruding from his lower back. He is very muscular and toned and has two antennae on his ears along with a large shell-like armor over his head that resembles a helmet. There are dark pigmented areas on his arms, legs, chest, and head, and he is also barefooted, both his hands and feet having only four fingers and toes respectively. I see you have not called on me for a simple chat this time around. Does this mean that you have a worthy opponent for me? Nothing less is acceptable. Miriam declared with the kind of self-confidence that is required of a king. W what the hell is that T. Sakura sputtered, her words dying in her throat as Miriam's head snapped in her direction. Sasuke and Tazuna both swallowing heavy gulps down their throats even though they were not the center of Maruam's piercing gaze. Call me a thing again and I will have your tongue for lunch. You will only refer to me as Maruam sama or your majesty, nothing less. Do we understand each other, human trash? Maruam asked rhetorically, 
Sakura barely able to summon the will to even nod her head in the positive given how scared she was. So much so that she didn't know if she would be able to even move a finger if that th the king from hell that Naruto just summoned decided to attack her. What the hell is that thing? Where did Naruto even get a summoning contract? This is bad. The situation is far worse than any of us predicted. I'll have to report this to Hokage-sama as soon as possible if I make it out of this alive that is. Kakashi thought wearily. Ahem, anyway, your opponent is known as the Demon of the Mist. Naruto said out of nowhere, successfully diverting Maruam's attention away from his pink-haired teammate. The Demon of the Maruam trailed off as Zabuza's water clone tried to sneak attack him. Emphasis on the word tried as Maruam sliced the clone into pieces in the blink of an eye without even turning around to face it. His tail-like stinger doing all the work at a speed that was unreadable to the naked eye, and even that of a trained shinobi. That was incredible fast. Kakashi thought with alarm, the real Zabuza's eyes narrowing wearily as he witnessed the effortless decimation of his water clone. This is your so-called demon? How disappointing, Maruam said condescendingly. That was just a water clone, it possesses only a tenth of the original's true power, Naruto countered. Like I said, how disappointing, Maruam declared with finality, Zabuza's eyes narrowing even further at Maruam's declaration, his pride wounded at the fact that this thing, despite being told that the water clone had only a tenth of his power, still thought of him as an unworthy opponent. Big words for a measly little insect, Zabuza retorted. The only human worthy of my attention is Naruto-sama, otherwise humans are nothing but trash before the might of the Chimera and King. Know your place, human scum, Maruam retorted as he turned around to face the demon of the mist. H.N. I never, in my wildest dreams, imagined I would live to see the day that an ant talks down to a human, Zabuza retorted. Naruto-sama, tell me a little more about this foolishly arrogant human, Maruam requested, though it sounded more like a hybrid between a request and a demand really. He is a member of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, each of them wielding specially designed swords that have special abilities, and trained in the art of silent killing. He is supposed to be the best in the art of silent killing and as you can see, he also has a large repertoire of water elemental ninjutsu. He has an A-class ranking in the bingo book and defected from Kiri after a failed assassination attempt on the Mizukage. Naruto explained clearly and concisely. He's only an A-rank ninja? I thought I told you to summon me only to fight the strongest of them all. Why did you summon me to fight someone who doesn't have an S-class ranking? Maruam asked irritably. The bingo book entry was made a couple of years back, so I figured that he might have become stronger since then, especially considering the ease with which he took care of Kanoha's legendary Kakashi of the Sharingan. However, if you feel he is not worthy of your efforts, then you need only free Kakashi Sensei from his prison, and then we can let him fight the demon. Consider the entertainment of watching their battle as compensation for wasting your time, Naruto replied diplomatically. H.N. I suppose that will do, Maruam trailed off as he spat out a mud bullet from his mouth, a bullet that moved so fast that Zabuza was already crashing into the surface of the water on his back a whooping thirty meters away from where he was initially standing by the time he became aware of what was happening. Trying to get up immediately and adopt a battle stance only to double over in pain as he felt the crushing effects the mud bullet wrecked on his liver. Fortunately for him, the bullet didn't penetrate through his flesh, but the blunt force of the impact was more than enough to make him suffer. There. Don't expect me to help you if you get captured again, human trash, Maruam said at the copy ninja, Kakashi glaring daggers at the king and the blonde Uzumaki, the blonde Uzumaki raising a single eyebrow at the copy ninja's reaction to being saved, feeling that a thank you was the least he and Maruam deserved. You and I will have a word later, Kakashi said as he turned and ran after Zabuza. Kyuso, that thing is strong. I don't think I'll be able to take it down on my own, especially if I have to take down Hataki Kakashi first. I might need Haku to get involved if I stand any chance of beating that thing. Where the hell did the brat get that thing anyway? Zabuza. Thought as he finally managed to get back to his feet, just in time too as a pissed off Hataki Kakashi arrived to face him for round two. Twenty minutes later. Who the hell are you? Sasuke asked as what looked like a masked guy not much older than he and his team were arrived at the battle scene, the guy who had just killed Zabuza with nothing but a few well-placed Saban, after Kakashi Sensei had gone through hell and back just to get an advantage on the guy. I am a hunter ninja from Kirigakure's Undertaker unit. I've been tracking this guy for a long time and I finally caught up to him, thanks in part to your mentor. The masked teen replied robotically. How old are you? Sasuke demanded, frustration and anger permeable in his tone and body language, as if it wasn't bad enough that Naruto seemed to possess way more power than he did, if it turned out that this guy was also in his age group, Sasuke wasn't sure how he would be able to keep himself together. About a year or so older than you, though I'm not supposed to give out any information about myself. I'm sure you understand. The masked teen replied robotically, a deep frown etching itself onto Sasuke's facial features as he clenched his hands in frustration. What have I been doing all this time? 
Naruto is Naruto is clearly stronger than me, that no eyebrows freak was stronger than I am now when he was only 10 years old, and now this guy is an elite ninja of his village even though he is only one year older than me. What am I supposed to do to get stronger? How am I ever going to become strong enough to kill Itachi at this rate? Am I really that weak? Sasuke thought in frustration. In any case, I will take this corpse with me and dispose of it. Thank you for your help, Hataki Kakashi-san. Wait just a moment. Why don't you dispose of the body here, right in front of us? Isn't that standard protocol for you hunter ninja, to dispose of the body at the place of death, as quickly as possible? Maruam inquired with a suspicious gaze. Maruam Dunno is correct. There's something wrong about I see now. He must be the Hayatan bloodline limit user, just as I initially suspected when I sensed his presence. I must be losing my touch. I should have realized he was lying about being a hunter nin. After all, he did arrive at the same time as Zabuza. Naruto thought self-critically. Kill them both Maruam Dano. He's not a hunter nin. He's Zabuza's partner. Naruto ordered hastily. Maruam, in the blink of an eye, sprinting towards the masked hunter ninja with the intention to maim and kill. However, much to his and everyone's surprise, a mirror made out of ice appeared right in front of him, causing him to crash into it. Or so Naruto, Kakashi, and Maruam thought would happen, as instead of crashing into the mirror, Maruam seemed to get sucked into it, disappearing completely into the mirror only to appear a few meters away, flying out of another mirror that had manifested out of thin air and skidding to a halt a distance away. The masked teen, acting quickly, formed another ice mirror in which he and Zabuza disappeared, Kakashi attempting to follow them into the mirror only to, much to his surprise, crash into the mirror and fall flat on his back. So he can decide who gets teleported and who doesn't? What an interesting guy. He will make the perfect present for SDs when I present his body to her, Naruto thought with a small smirk. SDs was one of the members Naruto had recruited for the bloodline, however, she was stuck in snow country and unable to leave because her whole ninjutsu repertoire required the freezing temperatures of snow country in order for her to use it. Without the conditions of snow country, SDs wouldn't be able to use her ice-style ninjutsu, because unlike Zabuza's accomplice, she didn't have the Hayatan bloodline limit. There was of course another reason for her to remain in snow country for now, that being specifically for the protection of Kokiheim until such a time that Naruto ordered her to take out Dotu and his thugs so that Kokiheim could take her rightful place as the princess slash daimyo of Snow Country. The reason Naruto had held off on that order was because of the fact that Kokiheim wanted to use her father's device to turn Snow Country into Spring Country. However, as SDs would lose her ability to use Hayatan techniques if such a scenario played out, she had only agreed to protect Kokiheim but not to help her any further than that. But with Haku's corpse, Naruto would be able to persuade SDs to go through with their plans and take part in missions outside of Snow Country after that. That insolent Ninjen. How dare he embarrass me like this? Naruto-sama, summon Patu and Chitu. I want to use their abilities to corner this cowardly human trash and make him fight me head on, Maruam ordered impatiently. Naruto understood immediately the reason why Maruam wanted the help of those two in particular. Patu is a sensor type with an incredible sensing range which would prove useful for tracking down a teleporter like the masked ice user. And Chita's ability would enable him to transport both Maruam and the masked Hayatan user to an alternate dimension that he usually transports his opponents in order to force them to play tag with him, though in this case it would be to prevent the Hayatan user from teleporting away, thereby forcing him to engage Maruam Dano. Okay, but make sure you keep his corpse intact, both their corpses actually. I also want Zabuza's sword delivered to me, Naruto ordered as he bit his thumb again, the previous bite having already healed a long time ago. I'll summon Flutter as well just in case the masked ice user is also good with chakra cloaking barriers, so that he can use his dragon flies to track them down. Naruto thought. Kuchios no jutsu. Naruto whispered with his hands clasped together, three new figures becoming visible once the smoke faded away. One of the figures is a very tall and lithe figure wearing nothing but a pair of shorts, with purple hair and the fur and stripes of cheetah covering his entire body, and unsurprisingly, his face and the lower parts of his legs resembling those of a cheetah too. The other figure, the one who was airborne, basically looked like a humanoid dragonfly who seemed to be wearing an old-fashioned dress, old-fashioned as in the type of clothing one would expect from an old lady. Finally, the third figure looked the most humanoid of them all, in fact, were it not for the long tail, exoskeleton-like knees, and the cat-like ears at the top of her head, anyone would be forgiven for mistaking her for a human. She had razor-sharp teeth, but so did Zabuza, so that feature alone didn't do anything to harm her human appearance. She was wearing orange knee-length shorts a blue blazer and black shoes, showing that she had a strange fashion sense just like her kin. Nayoruto sama The aforementioned chimera and exclaimed with childlike giddiness as she tackled the blonde Uzumaki to the ground, a resounding oof. Coming from the blonde Uzumaki upon impact as he was unexpectedly taken down, the humanoid feline creature, now identifiable as a female chimera and by Naruto's peers judging by her bust and pitch of voice, 
wrapping her strong and long tail around the blonde Jinchuriki's arms to restrict him and then proceeding to, for lack of a better term, lick the shit out of his face before sticking her tongue into his mouth as she initiated a very sloppy but passionate kiss with her summoner. The kiss lasted for at least forty seconds as she felt the blonde up all over his body, and for a while there everyone thought that she would strip him down and ride the brains out of him right then and there. Kakashi, despite himself, couldn't help but to be turned on by the scene transpiring right before his eyes, discreetly wiping the blood from his nose and wondering if maybe he should write to Jiraiya-sama and request that he make a bestiality volume of the Ika Ika series. Sasuke on the one hand was caught between too many minds. On the one hand he was envious of Naruto, as he had no idea what it felt like to be with a woman, not even having gone as far as first base, and yet on the other hand he felt disgusted by the act of a human being and an animal, albeit a very attractive looking animal being together like that. Yet, his body seemed to react in the opposite of his mind as he found himself having to stick his hands into his pockets in an effort to hide his erection. Sakura wasn't faring any better, struggling between her hormones and the urge to stomp Naruto to death for doing something so perverted in front of her, especially at a time like this. Still, deep down, she knew she wouldn't have minded if it were her and Sasuke doing something like this, she would prefer they do it in a more private setting of course, but if a public setting was her only chance to snare the love of her life into her clutches, then she would not let the opportunity pass her by. Am I miss you so much Nayoruto sama I wish you'd summon me more often, the sexy feline said as she smothered and dry humped the blonde Uzumaki. What are you doing, Patu? Maruam asked with a disgusted tone. Nya, Patu cried as she jumped as far away from the blonde Uzumaki as she could, almost as if Naruto had just electrocuted her or something. Why your majesty? W what are why you doing H here? Patu stuttered with a wide-eyed expression. That's my line. Is that any way to behave during a mission? Remind me to punish you when our business here is done, Maruam said with a grave undertone. I beg of you to forgive her, Maruam Dano. It is my fault for allowing her to behave in such a manner. I will personally see to it that the situation is rectified. You won't have to worry about such behavior either in a public setting or on a mission, Naruto apologized eloquently. I forgive her, but she will receive her punishment nevertheless when we return. My brethren need to understand that no exceptions will be made, Maruam retorted. Okay, I understand, Naruto replied with an apologetic look to Pitu, Pitu returning the look with a genuinely happy smile, happy not only because Naruto-sama fought for her, but also because the king, despite his displeasure and subtlety, pretty much gave her permission to carry on in her pursuit of Naruto-sama as a mate, after all. By his own words, the only reason he was displeased was not necessarily because she basically sexually assaulted Naruto-sama, but because she did it during a mission. Ha! Huh. Young love, Chita said with an amused tone, causing a hue of red to spread across Patu's cheeks, this being one of the few times the white-haired feline would curse her human-like skin tone as it wasn't very effective in terms of hiding her emotions. Ahem. As much as I would like to join you in making Patu-sama as uncomfortable as possible, I believe that now is not the time, Chitu. I believe Marum-sama would not have had us summoned unless there was something important he had to say to us, Flutter said with a deep and masculine voice, causing Sasuke, Sakura, Tazuna, and Kakashi to figuratively scratch their heads in confusion, each one of them wondering why the hell that thing was wearing a dress if it was in fact a guy. Flutter, it seems like you are the only competent one of my brethren, but rest assured, I will rectify the situation as soon as we return to our home. Right now I want you all to follow me, I will explain everything on the way. See to it that you keep up. Maruam ordered as he disappeared in a burst of speed, not even bothering to ask why Naruto had summoned Flutter, as he had figured it out almost instantly, the others quickly scurrying behind him as they attempted to keep up with the king. Thankfully, both Patu and Chitu were speedsters and Flutter's ability to fly gave him an advantage in long-distance traveling. That was fast, way too fast. That was Celestial Gate's level speed, fifth gate at the very least. Kakashi thought with wide eyes. His Majesty Marum Dano will take care of the threat. We should head towards Tazuna-san's place and set up a parameter in case either Zabuza has other accomplices, or Gato has contracted another assassin. Both scenarios are unlikely, but we should exercise caution nonetheless, Naruto suggested, Kakashi giving him one of too many suspicious gazes that the blonde Uzumaki had been subjected to since he joined the copy ninja's team, Kakashi asking himself a whole lot of questions about the blonde Uzumaki. Least of all why the blonde Uzumaki spoke as if he had been in this situation many times before, as if he was a shinobi veteran as opposed to the wet behind the ear genin he was supposed to be. However, despite his many reservations, and many more questions, Kakashi knew that Naruto was absolutely right, and he also knew that now was not the time to interrogate the blonde Jinchuriki. He barely had enough chakra as it is to defend himself should another attack become imminent, and as much as he was loath to admit it, 
Naruto was their only hope of survival at the moment if there really was another attack coming soon, which wasn't much considering that at this point, Danzo and his root army aside. Naruto was the least trustworthy Konoha shinobi that copy ninja knew. Good idea, Sakura, Sasuke, Naruto. Form a triangle defensive formation around Tazuna-san as we head on wards Kakashi trailed off as he lost consciousness, the small effort of taking a single step forward proving too much for the physically and mentally exhausted copy ninja, and more importantly, chakra exhausted copy ninja. As he fell face first on the ground. K. Kakashi sense, Sakura cried frantically, a shocked and fearful expression laced on her facial features, Sasuke trying to hide his concern but also clearly rattled by the sudden collapse of his sensei. I was wondering how long he was going to be able to keep up that facade. The blonde Uzumaki thought as he created two shadow clones so that they can carry the copy ninja, his chakra sensing ability having enabled him to predict this sort of outcome. Don't worry, he won't die. He is just suffering from severe chakra exhaustion, but not severe enough to cause death I think. Focus on protecting Tazuna-san, my shadow clones and I will handle the rest, Naruto ordered authoritatively, Sasuke's left eyebrow twitching slightly at being ordered around by the dog however managing to restrain himself due to the gravity of the situation, being honest enough with himself to realize that he was currently out of his depth. Though that didn't make him feel any less insulted and agitated. Following morning, Tazuna's house. To say Naruto was in a good mood this morning would equate to the greatest understatement of all time. He was in such a good mood that he'd even gotten up early to help Tsunami with her breakfast preparations. The scarcity of food and money in the household, all due to Gato's tyranny, had almost dampened his good mood, however, the issue had quickly been resolved as Naruto had asked her to make a list of any ingredients she needed to make a big meal for them, and then went on to summon said ingredients from a seal on his left wrist. He'd also summoned a lot more ingredients for future purposes and helped Tsunami-san stock up the shelves and the refrigerator. She'd been resistant to his generosity initially, but Naruto had been insistent, which was good because his mood had eventually rubbed off on her as a result. The reason for his good mood was due to King Marum's success yesterday. Naruto had discreetly switched himself with a shadow clone when he sensed their chakra close by and went out into the woods to meet his self-made summons, and was met with the evidence of Marum's success as the king presented both the ice user and Zabuza's corpses along with the Kubikiri Bocho. Marum had, very reluctantly, complimented the ice user, not for his raw power or brute strength, but for his speed, intelligence, and ingenuity in battle. Of course, much to Naruto's bemusement, the king had expressed his feelings that the ice user was still trash but that this trash was less smelly than most humans. Naruto had been pleased, and very grateful, and had expressed those feelings to the king as he dismissed them, though leaving Flutter behind as he needed him to deliver a sealed shadow clone along with the ice user's corpse to SDs in Snow Country. The trip would normally take six days by foot, ship, and train put together, but Naruto was confident that the dragonfly was almost there by now as the trip was exponentially quicker by air. The shadow clone was being transported so that it can perform the chimera no jutsu to fuse the ice user's corpse into SDs, thereby granting her the ice user's bloodline limit, skills, and knowledge. This would set up the stage for SDs to dethrone the corrupt Dotu and place the rightful heir, Kyukiheim on the throne, and of course, for Kyukiheim to activate her father's device and turn snow country into spring country as her father envisioned. From there Flutter would have to travel to demon country to meet up with Momochi Zabuza's 16-year-old cousin, Momochi Gatsu. Momochi Gatsu is one of the members of Naruto's bloodline organization, with origins from Kirigakure no Sato. The guy loathed his cousin Zabuza more than anything in the world, and had sworn vengeance on Zabuza for what he'd done to their family, launching an attack on the Mizukage and then abandoning his family in Kirigakure no Sato to deal with the consequences of his actions. Consequences which were fatal as the Mizukage had ordered the immediate extinction of the whole Momochi family. Gatsu had been just a kid back then, but had managed to survive his mother sacrificing her life so that he can escape. He'd been on the run since then, fighting and barely clinging on to life as hunter ninja after ninja was sent after him, all the while his hate for his cousin growing with each day that went by. His life had been one of eternal misery and violence up until the day that he met Uzumaki Naruto in the Land of Moon. Back then, they had fought a closely contested battle, but Naruto had managed to sneak in a victory thanks to his proficiency with the Kyuubi's power, though said proficiency wasn't anywhere near the level it was today. Gatsu had expected Naruto to kill him, Unable to believe that, after evading and defeating so many experienced hunter ninja, his death would come at the hands of what was nothing more than a little brat, albeit a very strong one. However, Naruto had spared his life and offered him something he had forgotten even existed, a hand in friendship. Gatsu had been shocked to tears, never having realized how much he missed having a friend, someone to talk to, share secrets with, and someone to have your back no matter what. They had spent the rest of the month hanging out together and playing ninja, which was weird considering that usually the only people who play ninja are people who aren't ninja already. 
In any case, that's when Naruto had told him about the Bloodline organization, and about their goals. Gatsu had accepted the offer in a heartbeat, quite sure that anyone who had Naruto's trust was worth his trust as well, and Naruto had later given him the swift release Bloodline limit via the Chimera no Jutsu. Right now however Flutter was going to be delivering Zabuza's corpse along with the, the Kubikura Bocho to one of his best friends. He was hoping that Gatsu would allow him to fuse Zabuza into him. As a swift release user, Gatsu was good at wind and lightning techniques, as those were the elemental affinities that combined to form swift release. Naruto was hoping to give him water release as well from Zabuza along with the skills and knowledge of the seven ninja swordsman techniques. Gatsu was already an accomplished swordsman himself, and wielded a gigantic blade just like Zabuza, but the addition of the silent killing skills and other seven ninja swordsman skills, along with intimate knowledge of Keiji Rigikyu was something Naruto felt was worth Gatsu overlooking his hatred for the guy. It would also help him understand why Zabuza did what he did, and he would also get a better sword than the one he currently wielded. Totally worth it Naruto thought, though convincing Gatsu of that would be some task. In any case, there were other reasons for celebration, as Naruto had sent a four-man cell of shadow clones while Kakashi was passed out and had it eliminate every single one of Gato's thugs, including the man himself, though after torturing the bastard into conceding all the passwords to his bank accounts. For personal and business purposes and having him transfer all of his business assets to Tazuna's daughter Tsunami. When Naruto was done with this place, Wave Country was going to become one of the wealthiest and prosperous nations in the world, Tsunami was going to become the daimyo. And Tazuna-san would have enough funds to expand his business internationally. But most importantly, Wave Country would be inside his pocket. Hmm, that was a great meal Tsunami-san. I haven't had a nice home-cooked meal like that in like ever, Naruto said sincerely. T thank you Naruto-kun, but you give me too much credit. I'm sure your mother cooks nice home-cooked meals every now and again too, Tsunami replied, causing a tense silence to take hold of the dining room, Sasuke and Kakashi both looking in Naruto's direction with worried expressions. Wondering how the blonde Uzumaki would react to the raven-haired beauty's statement. Actually, I'm an orphan. I've been living by myself since I gained self-awareness, since I was four years old I think. Before then I was at an orphanage, but they kicked me out onto the streets, Naruto said with a dark tone and expression, Tazuna, Inari, and Tsunami frozen in shock at the blonde Uzumaki story, unable to comprehend why a three-four-year-old child would be kicked out of an orphanage and be allowed to live on the streets. I Naruto and I'm so sorry. I didn't know, Tsunami stuttered with a pained and remorseful tone and expression. It's okay, I got over it a long time ago. I've watched you with Inari and Tazuna-san since we arrived yesterday, and I've had a taste of your cooking. Despite everything happening in Wave Country, this is a lovely home, and it's all because of you. If I had a mother, it would have been wonderful if it were someone like you. Your great woman Tsunami-san, Naruto replied with a small smile, tears of both sadness and joy escaping the raven-haired woman's eyes as she smiled lovingly at the blonde Uzumaki a small red hue spreading across her facial features, though the blonde Uzumaki's words inspired a completely different reaction from the woman's rebellious son. As shut up, Inari exclaimed as he jumped up on his feet, banging his fists hard against the dining table. I Inari Kuin, a shock tsunami stuttered, totally perplexed by her son's behavior as, even though he seemed to brood all the time, he had never had an outburst like this before as he mostly kept to himself. I'm sick to my stomach of your presence, why don't you just go away, Inari exclaimed furiously. Huh? was Naruto's intellectual response, unintentionally infuriating the little kid even more than he was already. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You coming here talking big, making jokes, and laughing like an idiot. You don't know anything about our pain. You've never lost anyone so you don't know how it feels like to lose a precious person. Talking as if you could ever understand our pain. You don't know anything about true pain, and you're going to get mom and grandpa killed by making them believe in that nonsense. There's no such thing as a hero and Gato will come after my family now all because of you. I hate you, Inari exclaimed with tears now free falling from his eyes, his whole body shaking violently. Because of anger? Because he was crying? Naruto didn't know. If the atmosphere was tense before then there was no way to describe what it was right now, everyone stunned into silence by the boy's outburst, Sasuke and Kakashi getting ready to try and stop Naruto in case he lost his cool and attacked the boy. Tazuna and Tsunami too shocked to say or do anything about their grandchild and child respectively. Sakura pretty much in the same boat as them. You're totally right. There's no way I can possibly imagine what it's like to lose someone precious to me, because I never had anyone to begin with. However, doesn't that mean that it is also true that you can't possibly have any idea what it is like to have never had anyone care about you before? To come home to an empty house with no one to welcome you back home, to go home from school and have no one to help you with your homework? To not have a fatherly figure to teach you how to be a man, to not have a motherly figure to comfort and encourage you. To shop for your own food as a four-year-old and to prepare your own meals and iron your own clothes. 
to be totally alone in the world as you watch other kids enjoy the love and comfort of a family home. Can you say with certainty that your pain is greater than mine? Naruto asked rhetorically, Inori staring back defiantly at the blonde Uzumaki, but not having any retort to the blonde Uzumaki's words as he tried to imagine life without his mother and grandfather. Let me show you something. Do you know what this is? Naruto said as he stood up and lifted up his sweater, channeling chakra to his stomach to reveal the seal on his torso. Naruto. Shut up Kakashi, Naruto said dismissively, everyone's eyes widening in surprise at Naruto's casual dismissal of his sensei, even Inari, everyone realizing that, despite Naruto's calm and even tone, that he was royally pissed off right now and shouldn't be messed with, well, except for a certain pink-haired Kunoichi, who clearly didn't read the manual. Naruto. How dare you talk to UK Sakura trailed off and Naruto's gaze met hers, a massive amount of killing intent washing over her in that moment, her whole body trembling in fear as she shrinked back into herself. W what is that thing? Tazuna asked with a mesmerized look. I was born twelve years ago on September 10th, the same day that the most powerful of the tailed demons, the Kyubi no Kitsune attacked Konoha. The Yandame Hokage defeated the demon by sealing it into a child, and that child was me, Naruto said dramatically causing everyone with the exception of Kakashi to tremble in fear as realization dawned on them. W what? Inari stuttered fearfully. Yes, Inari, inside me, lives that beast, and there is a daily battle for control between me and the demon as it attempts to escape my body, killing me in the process. It is a battle of mental wills, a battle of the strength of chakra and body, and a battle of emotional stability. Admittedly, the Yandame Hokage seal gives me the upper hand in the battle, though it is loosening and eroding on an almost weekly basis. Naruto explained, though he was exaggerating a bit as he hadn't had trouble with the beast since he unlocked his chakra chains. And no way. How can such a thing be? Tazuna asked disbelievingly. It is indeed possible, and I have been hated, scorned, manipulated, deceived, abused, attacked, spat on, and hospitalized, all because of something that was beyond my control. I have had to overcome a lot to get to where I am, so Inari, if I could overcome something like that, then why can't you and the people of Wave overcome a puny little man like Gato? Naruto asked rhetorically. Silence the only response he was able to provoke from his audience, everyone's brains getting scrambled by the huge load of information. Some might say that Naruto was being melodramatic, some might say that he was throwing a pity party for himself instead of focusing on helping the people that were suffering now. Some might even say that this was his MO since he was just a five-year-old, always trying to make everything about him so that he can get people's attention, part of his histrionic behavior, and maybe, just maybe, there might be some truth to those words. However, to Naruto, this was nothing more than a calculated move in a long line of schemes that he was cooking up in his brain. The objective was simple, get sympathy points from the future richest man in Wave Country, Tazuna, and the future daimyo slash princess of Wave Country, Tsunami, who is also the future richest woman in Wave Country, and of course, from the kid who was the heir to both of them. Within that same objective, his goal was to get them to view Konoha in a negative light because of what they did to him so that he when the time came that they had to choose between an alliance with Konoha and the bloodline, the choice would be rudimentary. In any case, you guys don't have to worry about Zabuza, Haku, or Gato and his thugs anymore, they're all dead, Naruto said in a matter-of-fact tone. W what? Inori trailed off with a wide-eyed expression, which pretty much summed up everyone's thoughts on the matter. He killed them? But when? He'd been here the whole did he use shadow clones? Sasuke thought, for the millionth time clenching his hands in frustration at getting so thoroughly outdone by the dove. Sakura, very quick to take note of Sasuke's discomfort, was about to give the blonde Uzumaki a piece of her mind but was unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how one wants to look at it, cut off by one Hataki Kakashi, who was able to beat her to the punch. Naruto, the assassination of Gato was not part of our mission. Our mission was to protect Tazuna-san until the completion of the bridge. You have overstepped your boundaries, Kakashi chastised disapprovingly. That's right, our mission was to protect Tazuna-san until the completion of the bridge, which is exactly what I did. The only way to truly protect someone is to eliminate the threat, which is exactly what I did. If not, then Gato would have either hired a greater number of shinobi, or gone and hired an S-ranked shinobi next time. I don't know about you, but I don't think our survival prospects would have improved had I not slayed Gato, Naruto replied clearly and concisely. But when did you do this? You've been here with us all this time, and who's this Haku person? Tsunami asked with a confused frown. I used shadow clones like the ones I used to carry Kakashi Sensei's unconscious body here yesterday. I only needed four of them to do the job, though in all honesty one would have done the job just fine. Gato's security was lacking. As for your other question, Haku is the ice user who was helping Zabuza. The Chimera Ants told me his name when they delivered his and Zabuza's body last night when you were all sleeping, Naruto explained. What was Tsunami's intellectual reply? 
Naruto, what have you done with Zabuza and Haku's body? And where is the Kubikurabocho? Kakashi asked with his lone visible eye narrowed at the blind Uzumaki. Spoils of war, they belong to me. I will use the knowledge I gained from their bodies to enhance my own knowledge and hopefully that knowledge will be used for generations by the descendants of Uzumaki Naruto. I've yet to decide what to do with the Kubikurabocho. I'll study it of course. But once I'm done, maybe I'll use it as my weapon, maybe I'll sell it back to Kirigakure no Sato, maybe I'll use it to broker a treaty alliance when I become Hokage. Who knows? The possibilities are limitless, Naruto replied with a far-off expression. Or you could hand it over to the Hokage, along with the corpses, I'm sure you'll be compensated handsomely for your hard work, Kakashi suggested. I'm not gonna happen. Possession of the corpses and the sword are compensation enough for me. I think I'll hold on to them, Naruto retorted much to Kakashi's displeasure. Anyway congratulations Tsunami-san. You are now officially the richest woman in Wave Country, and one of the richest people in the world. What? Six hours later. It's time for me to go and prepare lunch Naruto-kun. Can we continue with this a little later? Tsunami asked with a heavy sigh, unable to believe how much fatigue using your brain could cause, almost just as much as manual labor as far as she could tell. She'd spent the whole morning with the blonde Uzumaki as he tried to teach her everything she would need to know in order to effectively run Gato Corporations. Oh wait, it was Tsunami Corporations now wasn't it? It was honestly quite a lot to take in, but Naruto had promised her that she would have it all down by the time that her father was done with the bridge, which would take another two weeks to complete according to Naruto's estimations. Initially, she was terrified by the prospect of becoming the owner of any corporation, much less such as gigantic one and she almost had a nervous breakdown when Naruto told her his plan to use her financial resources not only to help Wave Country's economy and fund the incorporation of her grandpa's Wave Constructions company, but also to use said power to assume the political role of Wave Country's daimyo. However, the more Naruto talked her into it, the more he explained his reasons and the more he encouraged and showed his confidence in her, the more excited she became at the prospect of becoming such a powerful and inspirational figure for her people. To be in a position to help those in need and to matter to someone other than her own family. Still, there were dangers out there, for one, there were associates and rivals of Gato that wouldn't be happy with her running things now, and there were those whose corporations Gato had stolen by making them sell to him at cheaper prices while they were under duress. Those people would want to gain something back when they found out that Gato was gone, and they would make her their target as a result. Also, the fact that she was a woman would make her all the more of an appetizing target for many of Gato's former rivals, and now her potential rivals. However, Naruto promised her that her status as daimyo alone would be enough to deter such actions, but just to be safe, he promised to organize protection for her until she could get her own army set up, so all in all, the future was looking good for her, her family, and her people. It's okay, you can take the rest of the day off. We'll rendezvous tomorrow morning, same time and same place, Naruto said as he gathered all the documents so that he can reseal them into a scroll. Okay, thanks Naruto-kun. Tsunami said as she kissed the blonde Uzumaki on the forehead before hurriedly skipping her way to the kitchen, Naruto touching the place where she had kissed him with dazed expression on his facial features. Her lips are so soft, and what Naruto thought before shaking his head quickly. What am I thinking? She's not a shinobi, so my age will definitely be an issue for her. Though as a daimyo, she'll have to learn that age is practically irrelevant when it comes to political marriages. For all we know Inari could become betrothed to a thirty-year-old. He couldn't teach the kid how to use chakra of course as that was illegal for him to do as a Konoha shinobi, and he had no doubt in his mind that Kakashi would report him. However, he was teaching the kid how to fight with the sword, kunai, shuriken, knife, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was also going to be putting the kid through a whole lot of physical training and by the time he left, he was sure that he would have developed an adequate program for the kid to follow even after he was gone. He wanted the kid to be able to at least school random bandits and thugs like some of the ones that Gato used to take over wave country and he wanted the kid to be able to protect his family should the need arise. The rest of the stuff he needed to know, mainly stuff about his mom and grandpa's business, and about the role of a daimyo, he would learn from his parental figures. In any case, I wonder how Sasuke and Sakura are doing with the tree-climbing exercise. Naruto thought after sealing all of the documents away on a scroll, the blonde Uzumaki using his chakra sensing to locate their position, and then heading that way immediately. Elsewhere, heading to Wave Country. Just a few more hours and we will reach Wave Country, Sa Tama sensei A young man said from a standing position on the left side of a medium-sized ship, looking over the ocean with a very serious expression etched on his facial features. He is man not too short but not too tall either, just above average in height, about 19 years old in age. He has spiky blonde hair, pale skin, eyes that are completely black with the exception of his pupils, which were gold in color. He is wearing black pants along with black half boots tied around his lower legs with brown strings and has a brown weapons pouch on his left thigh. 
Up top he is wearing only a sleeveless dark blue top and black fingerless gloves on each of his hands. He? I thought we'd be a lot closer than that by now. Naruto-sama is probably cross with us. It's been over six months since he ordered us to track Sabuza and his apprentice down, and we still haven't caught up to them. We totally suck at this, I blame you, Genos. The other man, Saotama replied with one of the laziest speech patterns that his friend and apprentice had ever heard. Saotama is a man of average height, perhaps slightly on the short side, with absolutely no hair visible anywhere on his body. He is wearing dark orange slash red two-piece sleeveless outfit tied with a black sash around the waist along with a black short sleeved t-shirt underneath the sleeveless top and is also wearing similar footwear to his apprentice. He is wearing Goku's outfit. You're right, it is my fault. However, this time I am sure that we'll catch up to them in Wave Country. I won't fail Naruto-sama again, Genos vowed to himself. If it wasn't for Naruto-sama, I would have died that day. I wouldn't even have a body had I miraculously survived. Naruto-sama dedicated two years of his life to the Genos project. I have a synthetic body to do the normal things that other humans can do. And a mechanical body parts and weapons that I can summon to protect myself and those precious to me, all thanks to him. He even had me apprentice to Saotama sensei so that I can learn to use my new body and the weapons of destruction that come with it, and he gave me a purpose in life other than revenge. I will not fail no matter what it takes. Genos thought as he clenched hard on the railing, causing the metal to groan and cave in on itself. Oh Ayui, I was just teasing. It's not your fault, Zabuza is just ridiculously good at covering his tracks that's all. Saotama apologized in an attempt to pacify his frustrated apprentice. I know. It's just that, this is a very important mission. The situation in Snow Country depends on our success in order to be resolved, and I'm sure Naruto-sama is hoping that we kill Zabuza before he runs into Gatsu. Despite what Zabuza did, I'm sure Naruto-sama doesn't want Gatsu to bear the burden of having to kill his own family member, and neither do I. Geno said with a deep frown. Ah ha this is so troublesome. Suzumabachi and Fuka would have been far more suitable for this mission, if only they didn't have their hand tied down at the moment. They would have tracked this guy down long ago, Saotama retorted. Indeed Genos trailed off thoughtfully. Chapter End What if Naruto has Sharingan and Bloodline? Thanks for watching my video till the end. If you enjoyed this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel, and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down and thanks for watching the video, and see you guys in the next video.